Part One of Guides to the Zoological Gardens, Bellevue, Manchester. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Official Guide to the Zoological Gardens, Bellevue, Manchester. Open every day from 10 a.m. Program of Attractions, Season 1891. Price one penny. Messrs. Danson's Grand Daylight Panoramic View of the Field of Inkerman, showing the precipitous cliffs, deep ravines, and rugged country in the vicinity of Sebastopol. Every Monday, Wednesday, and Saturday during the season will be represented the ever memorable Battle of Inkerman, fought on the 5th November 1854 between the allied armies of england and france against the russians the thrilling spectacle will be followed by a naval review showing an attack by torpedo boats upon a squadron of ironclads band of the gardens daily during the summer every monday wednesday and saturday during the winter months guide to the zoological gardens bellevue manchester eighteen ninety one for cab and omnibus fares see pages thirty one and thirty two the gardens are situate between the hyde and stockport turnpike roads and have three main entrances one at each extremity and one about the centre of the grounds the hyde road entrance which is the most central is on the north side of the gardens on the hyde road and is approached from manchester either by that road or by the Ashton Road. The distance from the Manchester Infirmary is about two and a half miles, and the Manchester Carriage Company's omnibuses and tramcars run to and from this entrance every few minutes. The Ashbury Station on the Manchester Sheffield and Lincolnshire Railway is near this entrance, also the new Bellevue Station. The Longsight or Western Entrance is near the Longsight Station, on the London and North Western Railway. Omnibuses and tramcars also run from Market Street every three minutes during the day to this entrance, or near to it. The entrance is also about two and a half miles from the infirmary. It is used chiefly by visitors from the southern parts of the city and by those arriving from stations on the London and North Western Railway. The Gorton or Eastern Entrance and Hotel opened in the year 1876, is on the Hyde Road, and is near the Bellevue Station on the Midland Railway. This is the most convenient for passengers arriving by the Midland Railway, and for parties in conveyances from ashton under Lyne, Hyde, and the surrounding districts. Commodious stables have been erected in connection with the hotel at this entrance, and here, as at the general entrance, where accommodation is provided for several hundred horses, no charge is made for stabling. The admission to the gardens for the coachman or servants accompanying each carriage is, however, the same as for other visitors. Entering the gardens at the general entrance, and turning to the left, visitors will find the new aviary and lion and tiger house. The cages are numbered, and contain specimens as follows. 1, 2, 3, and 4. The Brazilian Caracara, one of the smaller hawk-like birds of prey inhabiting Central and South America. 5. Peregrine Falcon, Scotland. In olden times, this variety was much used for hawking herons and pigeons. 6. Neophron, or Egyptian vulture, sometimes known as the scavenger vulture, inhabits Africa and portions of India. Its food is carrion of every description, but occasionally small animals and birds. 7, 8 and 9. Great eagle owls, inhabiting North Asia and portions of Europe, the largest of the owl species, will often attack young deer, but feeds mostly on hares, rats, game birds, etc. Pairs have frequently bred in aviaries and zoological gardens. 10. Parakeet macaws, South America. 11. The ring-necked parakeet, P. docilis, India. A familiar bird, easily tamed, 
and can talk sometimes with considerable fluency. 12. Blue Mountain Parakeet, a beautiful bird from Australia. 13. Red Vented Parrot, South America. 14. Greater Rose Ringed Parakeet, West Africa. 15, 16 and 17. Rose Crested and Ducorps Cockatoos from the Moluccas. Very affectionate and familiar varieties of cockatoo and may be taught to speak with considerable fluency. 18. Barn Owl, common in most parts of the United Kingdom. 19. Brown or Wood Owls, British birds, common in wooded districts. 20. Laughing Jackass or Giant Kingfisher of Australia, in which country they associate in small parties, and at sunrise and sunset make the bush echo with their extraordinary laughing call. The nest is built in a hollow tree, and the food is mainly reptiles, the smaller lizards, snakes, frogs, etc. 21. Raven 22, 23 and 24. Magpies and jays, common British birds. 25, 26, 27. Ravens. The raven is found almost all over the world, and as far north as 81 degrees. In our country it is rather scarce, and is a shy bird, building in the high rocks, near the sea, or in a lofty fir. Their food is very miscellaneous. 28, 29 and 30. Young jackals, bred in the menagerie, a dog-like creature, found in Asia Minor, Persia and India. They associate and hunt together in packs after the manner of wolves. 31 and 32. Bitten, Africa. 33. Short-tailed opossum, Australia. 34. Black phalanger or opossum, Belideus, Australia. 35 and 36. Grey ichneumons, inhabits portions of southern India. It is a great enemy to all kinds of reptiles, but likes also birds and their eggs. 37 and 38. Red tiger cat from West Africa. 39 and 40. Skunk, an animal much sought after for its beautiful fur, is a native of North America. It is very ferocious and when irritated emits a most unpleasant odour. 41. Polish marmot, found in Poland, Galicia, South Russia and Siberia. They live in colonies and burrow under the ground. Food, mainly fallen fruit, roots, grain, etc., which they store for winter use. 42. American marmots, sometimes called prairie dogs, natives of North America, where they associate in large colonies in the prairies, burrowing in long passages under the ground. They live entirely on buffalo grass, roots, etc. 43 and 44. Grey Opossum, Australia. One and the commonest of, a numerous variety of animals peculiar to Australia, are boreal in their habits and live exclusively upon vegetable food. They are nocturnal animals. 45, 46 and 47. Rattel, sometimes called the honey badger, is a native of India and Africa, a great lover of honey, which it is very successful in finding out. He is also a good climber and is one of a limited number of animals which are lighter on the upper parts than the lower portion of the body. 48. Raccoon, from North America, a sagacious animal about which many extraordinary stories are told. He is a good tree climber and is much hunted for his fur. 49. Badger, England. 50 and 51. Ocelots, natives of Central America. They are carnivorous and the most beautiful of a great number of spotted cat-like animals. Good tree climbers and very difficult to tame. 52. Badger, England. 53 and 54. Porcupine, Africa. A well-known animal, nocturnal in habit and lives upon roots and other vegetable food. In the centre of this compartment, the visitors will see a numerous collection of macaws and cockatoos on separate stands, amongst which may be pointed out the great blue and yellow macaw, 
the red and blue macaw, the hyacinthine macaw, Maximilian's military macaw, and various others, all natives of South America. Note also the greater sulphur-crested cockatoo, white cockatoo with a large crest, roseate cockatoo with rosy breast and small white crest, natives of Australia. Entering now the central portion of this menagerie, we have in 55 an aviary containing several sulphur-crested and roseate cockatoos, and occupying one side of this compartment is a large general aviary. 56. Containing a miscellaneous collection of smaller birds, the most noticeable being the weaver birds or hang nests, having a head, neck and part of back black, orange chest and yellow belly, the tail and wing feathers being orange and black. They are very industrious, but noisy birds, and it is always interesting to watch them building their nests, which are entered from underneath. Java sparrows or rice birds with black head, white cheeks, pink bill and grey body, inhabitants of Java and most of the East India Islands, where they associate in great flocks. Then there are many kinds of the smaller finches, such as waxbills, saffron finches, diamond and black-headed finches, and mannequins. Here too may be seen that most elegant of the parakeets, the warbling grass parakeet of South Australia, sometimes called the budgerigar, which is imported into this country in great numbers. Also the red-headed lovebird and the crested ground parakeet, sometimes called the cockatiel, a slate-coloured bird with yellowish cheeks and crest, and an orange spot on each side of head, and a long tail. The visitor may also see here several kinds of very small turtle and other doves, and very frequently one or two kinds of plovers and other wading birds. 57. A smaller aviary, in which are several slender-billed and lemon-crested cockatoos. 58 grey-bellied conure, South America. 59. Green lorry, Southern Asia. 60. Bowers parakeet, Australia. 61 and 62. Parakeet macaw, South America. From the aviary, the visitor now enters the lion and tiger house. The first cage on the left contains a fine pair of tigers from Bengal. Adjoining them is a tigress recently purchased. The next compartment is divided into two cages, one of which is occupied by a fine black-maned South African lion and lioness, and the adjoining cage by a fine pair of young lions, forest-bred, caught in the Somali country, West Africa, and added to the collection since last season. Several lions and cubs will also be found in the next compartment leaving this house and passing the indian grotto work visitors will arrive at the ferneries hothouses and conservatories these are not always open to the public but admission may be obtained before two o'clock in the afternoon any day and on tuesdays thursdays and fridays up to six o'clock without extra charge by applying to the gardener who is generally at hand turning here to the extreme left and ascending a slight incline Visitors will find themselves on the banks of the Great Lake, which has recently been considerably enlarged, and now covers an area of upwards of eight acres. Numerous pleasure boats and miniature steamers ply upon this lake. The pleasure boats are let out at the rate of threepence or fourpence per half hour for each passenger, and one penny or twopence each is charged for a tour round the lake on the steamers. Near the lake on the left, are the steam horse and velocipede rings, a confectionery, ladies' refreshment room and lavatory. Visitors entering or leaving the gardens by the eastern entrance pass along the banks of this lake. Descending the bank past the refreshment rooms and turning to the left, visitors will be before the camellia and orange house and conservatory and in the Italian garden, which presents during summer a continuous display of choice flowers and plants. Passing through to the extreme corner from that at which the visitor entered, the three bear pits are reached. 
Ascending the steps, the visitor looks into the large circular den containing a pair of white or polar bears, inhabitants of the regions of perpetual snow and ice. Opposite to this is the brown bear pit, containing two fine specimens of the brown bear, one from Russia and the other from the Rocky Mountains, America. Adjoining is the black bear pit, which contains two specimens from the Himalayan mountains, India. Having inspected these, the visitor proceeds behind the great picture, through a small shrubbery to the left, passing under the ornamental bridge, until a small refreshment room is reached. A little further on is the Hampton Court maze. One penny each is charged for admission. Opposite the entrance to this maze is the Waterfowl Lake, which usually contains good specimens of the black Australian swan, Egyptian goose, mandarin, carolina golden-eyed wild shoveller and other kinds of ducks with teal and widgeon black-backed common and black-headed gulls and cormorants passing along either side of this lake and turning to the left the monkey house is reached a large well-lighted and ventilated building in moorish style designed by mr b firth in the central large cage are usually collected a miscellaneous group of monkeys, chiefly African and Indian, the oldest inhabitant of which is a female mandrill, which has now lived in the gardens eighteen years. In the same cage may be seen a large yellowish-brown monkey, with a black dog-like face. This is the Anubis baboon, a native of South and West Africa, a great plunderer in his own country, and so powerful and strong when full-grown, that a wide berth is given to him by both men and animals. Another dog-faced monkey will be noticed with a black face, and of a pale reddish-brown. This is the common dog-faced baboon. There are usually several young specimens in the cage. A familiar monkey may perhaps be noticed, with a black head of hair, a flesh-coloured face, and a light brown body and with a knowing but somewhat sad expression. This is the bonneted macaque. Another curious and interesting face is that of the sooty manga bay from West Africa. He is of a light slaty colour, black forearms and eyebrows, and white whiskers and flesh-coloured face, dappled with black. There are numerous other examples of this grotesque and motley group of creatures. The village pump and draw well by means of which the monkeys pump and draw water for themselves, the elevator whence they supply themselves with corn, and the large wheel, rocking horse, and other gymnastic appliances upon which the monkeys play, afford considerable amusement to children. In the large cages along one side of the monkey house will be found a 63. Porcupine India 64. Mandrill Baboons 65. Kima baboons, Chakma baboons, South Africa, 66. Rhesus monkeys, India, 67. Lemurs, natives of Madagascar, very agile and interesting, feeding mostly upon fruit, but will also eat birds' eggs and young birds. 68. Capuchin monkeys, sometimes called ringtails from various parts of South America, active and knowing creatures, readily tamed. Some kinds, from a plaintive cry they make, are called weeper capuchins. 69. Sooty Monkey, West Africa 70 and 71. Young sloth bears from India, great climbers and specially fond of honey and fruit, but will eat almost any kind of food. 72. Brush-tailed porcupine, Africa, and lemurs. Leaving the monkey house, visitors will arrive at the new maze, which is of entirely original design, and was planted in the spring of 1870. In the centre, a large piece of ornamental rockwork has been erected, from the summit of which a complete view of the plan of the maze may be obtained. One penny each is charged for admission. On the right of the maze will be seen a range of new cages, containing choice specimens of prize pigeons, kindly lent for exhibition by members of the Manchester Columbarian Society. 
turning to the left and walking alongside the maze, the visitor reaches several large open-air cages. 73. Male and female Wapiti deer of North America, the largest of the red deer family. Their fine branching horns are much sought after as trophies. The horns are shed or thrown off every year, generally in the month of April. New ones growing in about four months. They are at first covered with soft velvety skin. 74. Cape Buffalo, natives of South Africa, where they herd in considerable numbers. 75. North American Bison, once very common in the vast prairies of North America, where great herds, numbering many thousands, roamed, hunted only by the Red Indian. But of late years, such has been the advance of civilization, the animal has almost become extinct. The visitor now enters the paddock range of cages, and in 75 is an aviary containing a miscellaneous collection of foreign and British birds, several kinds of which have been seen in the aviaries in the Lion House. 76. Pelicans from southern Europe and North Africa live entirely upon fish, which they carry to their young in the pouch under the lower beak. 77. Molucca deer, bred in the gardens. 78. Black alpaca from Bolivia. The wool of these animals is used largely for manufacturing purposes. In this cage is also a Juanaco from Peru. 79. Hog or porcine deer from India. 80. Leucorix, a fine example of one of the larger species of antelopes from North Africa. 81. Indian antelope or black buck of India, one of the swiftest of antelopes. The females are light brown and have no horns. 82. Dwarf cattle from the Himalaya mountains and from the highlands of Afghanistan. 83. Axis deer, male and female, inhabits various parts of India and somewhat resembles in colour our British fallow deer. 84. Llamas from Bolivia, Peru and Patagonia, used to carry light burdens. 85. Zebra, South Africa. In the early days of the Dutch settlements, immense herds of these animals roamed the plains of South Africa. They are now becoming very scarce and difficult to obtain. 86 and 87. Malacca or Javan deer, female with young, bred in the gardens. 88 and 89. New, a peculiar animal, native of South Africa, with strong curved pointed horns and a broad nose. They herd together in considerable numbers and are difficult animals to tame. 90 and 91. Pondicherry vultures, India. 92. Condor female. The male has a large erect comb over the beak and head. They are peculiar to the highest peaks of the Andes in South America. 93. Pheasants, China. 94. Crowned Crane, South Africa. 95. Demoiselle or Nubian Cranes, common in many parts of Africa. 96. Australian Crane, commonly called Native Companion, one of the largest of cranes. 97 and 98. Curaçaos, one of a large and varied group of birds living in the forests of Central America and Guinea. 99. Golden pheasants, natives of China, richly coloured birds, frequently kept and bred in aviaries. 100. Silver pheasants, male and female, from China, but frequently bred in England. 101. Common pheasants, England. 102. Flamingos from the shores of the Mediterranean, Egypt and the Levant. Several kinds are known, varying from white to a deep scarlet. 103. Koipu rats from South America. They are aquatic animals and live on the borders of rivers and lakes. Making burrows in the banks and taking to the water readily, they live entirely upon vegetable food. 104. Jabiru stalks from Upper India. A very rare variety. Leaving these cages and turning to the left, 
several open air cages will be seen containing goats deer etc beginning with one hundred and five one hundred and six and one hundred and seven goats one hundred and seven a llamas peru proceeding onwards with the grazing paddock on the left and lawn for croquet on the right the visitor reaches an eastern like kiosk designed by thomas danson esq london which is divided into compartments containing emus and marmots these animals hibernate sleeping during the winter generally from november until the end of march visitors will now be near the long site entrance to the gardens where refreshments of all kinds may be obtained the commodious summer houses in the vicinity form pleasant retreats for picnic parties in the summer season from this point visitors may proceed either directly up the avenue towards the large hall or may cross the carriageway and passing over the croquet lawn inspect the kitchen salad and nursery garden connected with the establishments in this division also are situated the greenhouses and frames in which the bedding out plants are protected during the winter and where peaches grapes melons cucumbers etc are grown during the summer months passing the greenhouses and crossing over the drive and avenue towards the smaller ponds which usually contains good examples of the mandarin summer shoveler pintail and other ducks and pairs of black and white swans visitors will arrive at the new penguin house here may be seen a group of those extraordinary birds the black-footed penguin natives of the rocky coasts of south africa their erect walk paddle-like wings and grotesque appearance provoke much merriment in the tank where they are fed at short intervals they are very active and dive and swim with surprising quickness under the tank are several compartments a hundred and eight penguins from south africa a hundred and nine heron west africa a hundred and ten whistling penguin new variety young from the auckland islands new zealand a hundred and ten a and a hundred and eleven heron south america leaving this house but keeping to the left will be found several cages containing birds of prey a hundred and twelve urn or white-tailed sea eagle scotland a hundred and thirteen wedge-tailed eagle australia a hundred and fourteen griffon vulture central europe a hundred and fifteen milvago falkland islands a hundred and sixteen peregrine falcons caught in the isle of man and presented by mr trustrum of port erin turning now to the right the visitor enters the new sea lion house here in a large tank sixty four foot by twenty foot and three foot deep are shown a pair of californian sea lions these animals inhabit the northern pacific and are numerous on the coast near san francisco the animals go through a variety of evolutions in the tank diving from a height leaping over poles through hoops swinging on the crossbars etc the speed at which these animals rush through the water is most remarkable the male sea lions utter a loud barking noise facing the tank are several small cages a hundred and seventeen a hundred and eighteen reserve tank for sea lions a hundred and nineteen temporarily occupied by storks a hundred and twenty beaver canada leaving this house and turning to the right the camel house is reached the cages are numbered a hundred and twenty one zebu cow egypt a hundred and twenty two zebu or sacred cattle of east india they vary much in size from the white or grey examples to a diminutive dark red kind they have bred several times in the gardens a hundred and twenty three yak a native of the rocky parts of tibet in asia a hundred and twenty four young camel born in the gardens a hundred and twenty five sambur deer india a hundred and twenty six nilgai male india a hundred and twenty seven nilgai female india a hundred and twenty eight 
Herr David's Deer, Northern China. 129 and 130. Bactrian or Double Humped Camel from Asia Minor and Central Asia. 131. Zebu Bull, India. 132. Dromedary, Egypt. Leaving the Camel House, the visitor is now opposite the Elephant House, erected during the winter 1875. The right-hand cages are numbered. 133. Doves. 134. Kangaroos. 135. Rook, British. 136. Parakeets, various, India and Africa. 137. Turaco, West Africa. 138. Tufted Deer, Africa. 139. Piping Crows, Australia. 140. Several pairs of the crested ground parakeet or cockatiel. 141. Kangaroos. 142. Grey Cotimondi from South America. These are quarrelsome animals, good climbers, and feed upon almost any kind of food. 143 and 144. Red Cotimondi from South America. 145. Ring tailed or cat like lemur. A curious night roaming creature from south and west Madagascar, living in small troops and feeding mainly on fruits. 146 and 147. Red Cotimundi, South America. 148. Rat kangaroo, Australia. 149. Lima, Madagascar. 150. Tapir, from South America, lives near to water and is a good swimmer, food entirely vegetable. 151. Two Indian elephants, females. They parade in the gardens, carrying visitors at a small charge. 152. A young African elephant, purchased in 1883. Notice his large flapping ears. 153. Hippopotamus. Inhabiting the rivers of Central and South Africa, and although so awkward and clumsy, swims with perfect ease. He is a night-roaming animal, feeds upon aquatic plants, etc., and is much hunted for the tough hide and great teeth. 154. Rhinoceros, from the marshes and rivers of India. He is a ferocious animal and dangerous to hunt, having a thick and almost impenetrable hide. His food is entirely vegetable. Some kinds of these animals have two large horns growing over the nose. Leaving this house, a new range of cages will be seen on the left. These cages are occupied by various species of kangaroos, etc., and are numbered as follows. 155 and 156. Bennett's wallabies and young, bred in the gardens. These animals are natives of Tasmania, and breed freely in this country. 157. Yellow-footed rock kangaroo from South Australia, and Darbian wallaby. 158. Boomer kangaroos and young, New South Wales, one of the larger varieties of kangaroos. 159. Great kangaroo, Macropus giganteus, and small brush-tailed kangaroo, Australia. 160. Black-faced kangaroo, South Australia. 161 and 162. Bennett's kangaroos and young. Leaving this house and ascending the bank, visitors will have upon their left the outdoor platform for dancing upon and for other amusements, and from this point a complete view may be obtained of Messrs. Danson's grand open-air picture. The boats on the lake surrounding the painting are rowed by experienced men employed in the gardens. One penny each is charged for a tour round the lake. A miniature steamer has also been placed upon this lake. Adjoining the outdoor platform is an entrance to the great ballroom, available for shelter and in which concerts and balls are held. From this room is entered the refreshment room. The prices are fixed as detailed on page 30 and strict attention is paid that all articles sold are of the best quality. 
from the refreshment rooms are entered the two large tea rooms recently decorated in chinese style one shilling each is charged for admission tea with bread and butter etc is supplied to all within the room a charge of sixpence each is made for a plate of ham or beef to tea which with any other extras ordered must be paid for at the table visitors who have provided themselves with their own refreshments may obtain hot water teapots cups knives and other requisites in the large new room at the lower end of the music hall the entrance to which is in front of the picture near the lower end of the boarded or outdoor platform tuppence each is charged for this accommodation these rooms have been considerably enlarged the ladies and gentlemen's rooms are in the lower portion of the music hall and the parcel office is also here coats umbrellas baskets or parcels left during the day should be asked for at least a quarter of an hour before the fireworks to prevent the great crowding consequent on their being required immediately after leaving the music hall by the opposite door from which we entered we are in front of the printing office where the placards and handbills are printed announcing the extra attractions of the gardens etc beneath the printing room are dens for animals containing specimens as follows a hundred and sixty nine small white arctic foxes and a common fox a hundred and seventy and a hundred and seventy one wolves inhabiting various parts of europe and russia in asia in russia and many parts of central europe they are still very destructive a hundred and seventy two striped hyenas inhabiting southern asia arabia and northern africa a hundred and seventy three striped hyena a hundred and seventy four spotted or laughing hyena from south africa roams in the night in small parties and when excited utter a startling laughing yell from which it derives its second name passing the entrance to the printing office and entering the house containing leopards etc we have a hundred and seventy five and a hundred and seventy six jackals and young bred in the gardens asia and africa a hundred and seventy seven jackal and native dog sudan a hundred and seventy eight and a hundred and seventy nine puma or cougar a native of south and central america a hundred and eighty and a hundred and eighty one a fine pair of black panthers from asia a hundred and eighty two indian leopard a hundred and eighty three and a hundred and eighty four african leopards darker in hue than the indian variety leopards are expert climbers and live mainly upon the smaller antelopes monkeys etc a hundred and eighty five indian leopards leaving the leopard house the visitor will be at the entrance to the museum of natural history admission one penny here in a large gallery are a miscellaneous collection of birds animals reptiles etc almost of all which have lived in the gardens at the end of the room is a skeleton of the celebrated performing elephant maharaja late of Woonwells, which at the dispersal of that renowned collection in the year eighteen seventy two was purchased by messrs jennison and lived ten years in the gardens here too may be seen two or three cases of live pythons or boar constrictors one of these added to the collection during the past winter is nearly twenty feet in length and weighs over two hundred weight this python feeds in its natural state upon small deer hogs etc serpents from india africa and america lizards and water tortoises crocodiles alligators etc and also a case containing live marmosets lively and interesting little animals from tropical south america conveyance to and from the gardens visitors returning in private carriages may order their servants to be in waiting on the carriage road behind the music hall or near the general entrance the exit for visitors returning by omnibus or on foot and to the ashburys ardwick or manchester railway stations is near the entrance 
a wide gateway and passages being there available and as ten thousand persons can be passed from the gardens in ten minutes visitors will escape all the crowding on their return if they will wait a very short time visitors may also return by the long sight entrance or the new gorton entrance trams cars and omnibuses the manchester carriage company in conjunction with the corporation have completed two separate lines of tramways by each of which the gardens may be reached the most direct is the hyde road route the cars leave the exchange by this route every seven minutes throughout the year and more frequently on busy occasions the other route is via long sight where the cars and omnibuses run every three minutes during the greater portion of the day passengers alight by this route at the end of kirkmansume lane about a quarter of a mile from the long sight entrance to the gardens the fare by either of the routes by car or bus is fixed at threepence inside and twopence outside special accommodation has been provided for the loading of passengers after the fireworks by the cars and omnibuses of the company which will be drawn up in two lines on messrs jennison's private siding immediately to the left hand on leaving the hyde road gates in addition to the cars on the hyde road many buses will also be waiting and the public are respectfully informed that only by the buses and trams of the manchester carriage company can the above fares be guaranteed cabs are also waiting at each entrance to convey passengers to manchester the cab fares are ninepence per mile for one or two persons three or more persons one shilling per mile a list of cab fares will be found at the end of the guide railway from the london road station by the london and north western railway to longsight station two hundred and fifty yards from the lower entrance and by the manchester sheffield and lincolnshire to ashbury station eight hundred yards from the house entrance or by the new m s and l and midland company's route to bellevue station near the eastern entrance to the gardens the fares are to longsight and to the new bellevue station third class twopence second class threepence first class fourpence to ashbury station third class a penny halfpenny second class threepence first class fourpence the foregoing will for the most part serve as guide to all parts of the grounds open to the public the establishment in addition however contains a large confectionery bakery brewery gasworks electric light department printing office firework factory and other places of interest to view which special permission must be obtained End of part one. Part two of Guides to the Zoological Gardens, Bellevue, Manchester. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Guide to the Zoological Gardens, Bellevue, Manchester, 1917. Messrs. Jennison, in issuing this guide to their visitors, beg to intimate that whilst every effort is made to keep the cages stocked with specimens as described in the guide, vacancies unavoidably occur which are not readily filled up and may cause slight errors in description. A star denotes specimens deposited in or presented to the collection. The names of the donors to whom Messrs. Jennison tender their sincere thanks will be found on pages 25 and 26. For cab and tram fares, see pages 30, 31 and 32. The gardens are situate between the Hyde and Stockport turnpike roads and have three main entrances, one at each extremity and one about the centre of the grounds. The Hyde Road entrance, which is the most central, is on the north side of the gardens, about two miles from London Road Station and three miles from Exchange, Victoria and Central Stations, Manchester, and two and a half miles from the top of Market Street. The corporation tramcars from the centre of the city pass this entrance every four minutes. The circular route cars from Cheetham Hill in the east to Seymour Grove in the west also pass this entrance, 
thus connecting the gardens with all parts of Manchester and the adjoining districts. The Ashbury Station, on the Great Central Railway, and the Bellevue Station are near this entrance. The Longsight or Western Entrance, also about two and a half miles from Market Street, is near the Longsight Station on the London and North Western Railway. It is chiefly used by passengers from stations on that system and by visitors from the southern parts of the city. The circular route tramway passes close by, and the direct route from the centre of the city to Longsight, Levenshume and Stockport, with a frequent surface, is only 600 yards distant. The Gorton or Eastern Entrance and Hotel is on the Hyde Road, about three quarters of a mile distant from the Hyde Road station on the Great Central Railway, and near the Bellevue station on the Midland Railway. This is the most convenient for passengers arriving by the Midland Railway, and the nearest entrance for the Hyde Road station, and for parties in conveyances from ashton under Lyne, Hyde, and the surrounding districts. Commodious stables have been erected in connection with the hotel, and here, as at the general entrance, where accommodation is provided for several hundred horses and motor cars, no charge is made for stabling or garage. The admission to the gardens for the coachman or servants accompanying each carriage is, however, the same as for other visitors. Entering the gardens at the general entrance and turning to the left, visitors will find the aviary and lion and tiger house. The cages are numbered and contain specimens as follows. Roman numeral 1. Wood Owl. Corvus frugilagus, England, and Rook. Roman numeral 9, Kestrel, Falco tinunculus, or Windhover, England. 1. Barn Owl, England. 2. Long-tailed glossy starling, Lampratornis enus, West Africa. 3. Senegal parrot, Pyocephalus senegalus, West Africa. 4. Naked-footed owlet, Athene Noctua, Europe. These lively little birds have only recently been introduced into England, where they have made themselves very much at home. 5. Star, Mealy Amazon, Chrysotis farinosa. The Amazon parrots are found in large numbers, and of many varieties, in the hottest parts of Central and South America. 6. Yellow naped parakeet, Platycercus semitorquatus. West Australia. 7. Tovi parakeet, Rotogeris jugularis, Colombia. 8. Star, Bower parakeet, Platycercus sonarius, South Australia. This bird whistles the British grenadiers and other tunes. 9. Raven, Caucus corax, England. 10. Double fronted Amazon, Chrysotis levilanti, Mexico. 11. Alexandrine parakeet, Paleonis alexandri, India. 12. Ducorps cockatoo, Cacatua ducorpsi, Solomon Islands. 13. Leadbetter cockatoo, Cacatua leadbetteri, Australia. 15. Dingo, Canis dingo, the Australian wild dog. 16 and 17. Malabar squirrel, Scirius Maximus, India, a pet squirrel that has made many campaigns. 18. Badger, Meles Taxus, England, presented by Sir Philip Brocklehurst, Macclesfield. 20. Armadillo, Dasypus villosus, Brazil. 21. Albino rats. These rats are bred from Mus alexandrinus. This animal is closely related to Mus ratus, the English black rat, which has been almost exterminated by the Norwegian rat, Mus decumanus, our universal pest, estimated to cost the country £15 million per annum. 27. Ferrets, Putorius furo, a domesticated albinotic variety of the pole cat. 29. Ichneumon, Herpestes grisius, India, a brave little animal that attacks and kills snakes, very effective for clearing rats from warehouses or other large buildings. 30. Civet Cat, 
Vivaricula malacensis, India. 31. Rose-crested cockatoo, Cacatua molucensis, the Moluccas. 32. A small aviary, in which are yellow-crested cockatoos. In the centre of this compartment, visitors will see a numerous collection of macaws and cockatoos on separate stands, amongst which may be pointed out the great blue and yellow macaw, Ara Ararauna, the red and blue macaw, Ara Macau, green military macaw, Ara Militaris, Lear macaw, Anodorhynchus Leary, all natives of South America. Note also the greater sulphur-crested cockatoo, Cacatua galarita, white cockatoo, Cacatua alba, with a large crest, roseate cockatoo, Cacatua rosea capilla, with rosy breast and small white crest, natives of Australia. Entering now the central portion of this menagerie, we have 33, containing a miscellaneous collection of smaller birds, the most noticeable being the weaver birds or hangnets, Hyphantornis textor, having a head, neck, and part of back black, orange chest, and yellow belly, the tail and wing feathers being orange and black. They are very industrious, but noisy birds, and it is always interesting to watch them building their nests, which are entered from beneath. Java sparrows, pada orizivora, or rice birds with black head, white cheeks, pink bill, and grey body, inhabitants of Java and most of the East India Islands, where they associate in great flocks. Then there are many kinds of the smaller finches, such as waxbills, saffron finches, diamond and black-headed finches and mannequins, the pretty Gould's finch, Poifila Gouldiae, easily recognised by its red or black head, green back and purple breast, sharply cut off from a yellow body. Here too may be seen that most elegant of the parakeets, the warbling grass parakeet, Melopsitacus undulatus, of South Australia, sometimes called the budgerigar, which is imported into this country in great numbers. Also the cockatiel, Calopsitacus novoi hollandiae, a slate-coloured bird with yellowish cheeks and crest, an orange spot on each side of head, and a long tail. Note also the striking rosy pastor, Pastor Rosius, an Indian bird of the starling species, and the troupials, the blackbirds of North America. The visitor may also see several kinds of very small turtle and other doves, and very frequently one or two kinds of plover and other wading birds. 34. Rose-breasted cockatoo, Cacatua roseicapala, Australia. These birds are easily tamed and are often kept like pigeons on Australian homesteads. 35. Festive Amazon, Cacatua festiva, Guyana. 36. Indian ring-necked parakeet, Platycercus torquata, India. 37. Pennant's broadtail, Platycercus elegans, Australia. 38. Small green parakeet, India. From the aviary, the visitor now enters the lion and tiger house. In the first cages are a pair of magnificent jaguars, Felis onca, the largest cat inhabiting the New World. They are found from Mexico southward to Brazil, being particularly numerous on the Orinoco and Amazon rivers, where they feed on the tapirs and pecaris, or on the monkeys in the trees. In times of inundation, they are often dangerous to man. The remaining cages in this house are occupied by several adults and one young lion, born in the collection, Felis Leo. Lions are now found only in Africa, but were quite common little more than a century ago in India, where they probably preceded the tiger, which, thanks to its better protective colouring, has triumphed there in the struggle for existence. Leaving this house and passing the Indian grotto work, visitors will arrive at the ferneries, hothouses and conservatories. These are open to the public, and admission may be obtained before two o'clock in the afternoon, any day, and on Tuesdays, Thursdays and Fridays up to six o'clock, without extra charge, by applying to the gardener who is generally at hand. 
turning here to the extreme left and ascending a slight incline visitors will find themselves on the banks of the great lake which covers an area of upwards of eight acres numerous pleasure boats and miniature steamers ply upon this lake the pleasure boats are let out at the rate of threepence or fourpence per half hour for each passenger and one penny or twopence each is charged for a tour round the lake on the steamers near the lake on the left are the steam horse and velocipede rings the shooting jungle rifle range at targets running animals flying birds etc the ocean wave most realistic in movement tobacco divan present store confectionery ladies refreshment room and lavatory visitors entering or leaving the gardens by the eastern entrance pass along the banks of this lake descending the bank past the refreshment room and turning to the left visitors will be before the camellia and orange house and conservatory here is thirty nine the snake cage of a size and style never before attempted in any collection the moist heat and luxurious vegetation produce an atmosphere especially suitable for their health and their movements about the numerous trees are most interesting to watch as serpents are for the most part nocturnal they are best observed after nightfall for which purpose the cage is illuminated in the evening on gala days the specimens on exhibition are chiefly boas and rock pythons python molorus and boa constrictor from india and south america and sabre pythons from south africa some about twenty feet in length these kill their prey which chiefly consists of small deer hogs etc by coiling round it also the anaconda eunectes murinus the great water snake of south america which occasionally attains a length of thirty feet or more these are non-poisonous though their forked tongue is often falsely called a sting the young are hatched from eggs of which many batches have been laid but thus far the embryos have not hatched and incubated in the cage the gardens have however been more successful with the pine snakes Farancia abacura united states of america they frequent hot moist situations burrowing in the dank soil and at once took advantage of access to the luxuriant tropical corner of this cage where the young were produced they were about thirteen inches long when first perceived and grew rapidly attaining twenty-four inches at about six months old about ten have been seen but it is impossible to say how many more there may be the smaller lizards also breed in this cage the teju tupinambis tegexin from mexico and south america is represented by a fine specimen it dwells on the trees near rivers and feeds on fruit also small birds and their eggs forty the crocodiles and alligators are closely are closely related to the snakes but do not require so great a temperature the pool constructed for them in this greenhouse reproduces as near as may be the home of these creatures a tank in an indian temple there they lie prone in the sun or motionless in the sluggish water apparently inert nothing escapes their watchful eye animals and human beings are often dragged down when coming for water this is tersely summarised in Kipling's lines. Wait, ah, wait, the ripple saith, Maiden, wait, for I am death. Turning sharp to the left, visitors reach, 41, the flamingo cage. Ornate with rocks and caverns, and the shallow pools frequented by these brilliant birds, is at present occupied by a large Mississippi alligator, a prize of war taken in the German steamship Belgica. 42. Victoria crowned pigeons, Gora Victoriae, island of Joby. These beautiful birds have been bred with some success in this country and on the continent. Turn to the right for the Italian garden, which presents during summer a continuous display of choice flowers and plants. After examining the fine bullfrogs, Rana Catispiana, North America, in the window case, 
leave by the opposite corner of the garden. Here are the bears. Ascending the steps, the visitor looks into a large circular den containing two polar bears, Ursus Maritimus. Caught by His Royal Highness the Duke of Orleans on his Arctic expeditions in 1905 and 1907. Opposite to this is the brown bear pit, containing an extremely rare hybrid between the brown and polar bear, deposited in the collection by Lord Rothschild, FZS. Adjoining is the black bear pit, occupied by a Himalayan, Ursus Tibetanus, from the Himalayan mountains, India, and a Canadian black bear, star, Ursus Americanus. Having inspected these, the visitor may embark for a tour of the lake, passing through Aladdin's cave, recently designed by Mr. B. Hastain, or passing through the shrubbery, he will reach the electrical installation, erected in 1897 on the site of the Hampton Court maze. The motive power is provided by two engines yielding more than 500 horsepower, and the dynamos are capable of fully illuminating the gardens with arc and incandescent lights. The machinery can be seen at work each evening that the gardens are illuminated. Just beyond is the Helter Skelter lighthouse, and nearby a gay little Chinese pagoda marks the entrance to Laughterland full of beauty and replete with fun. To the right of this building are cages numbered 42A Dingo, Canis Dingo, Australia. The close affinity between these animals and the pariah dogs of Hindustan is valuable evidence that the aborigines of Australia are of Indian origin. 43 Star, Ground Civet, Vivera Civetta, Africa. 44 Star, Black Back Jackal, Canis Mesomelas, India. The jackals are scavengers of the east. They are cunning animals and credited with great wisdom in Indian folk tales. The jackal was the chamberlain to King Lion, hence the belief that the jackal is the lion's provider. In actual hunting, he is a great nuisance to the king of beasts. Opposite these cages is the waterfowl lake, which usually contains good specimens of the black Australian swan, Egyptian and Magellan geese, Mandarin, Carolina, Potchard, Wild Shoveler, Shell, Garganet, and Common Teal, Widgeon, and other kinds of ducks, with black-backed common and black-headed gulls. Passing along the side of this lake, and turning to the left, the monkey house is reached, a large, well-lighted and ventilated building in the Moorish style, designed by Mr. B. Firth. In the central cage, there are usually collected a miscellaneous group of monkeys, chiefly African and Indian. Notice a large yellowish-brown monkey with a black dog-like face. This is the Anubis baboon, Cynocephalus Anubis, a native of South and West Africa, a great plunderer in his own country, and so powerful and strong, when full-grown, that a wide berth is given to him by both men and animals. Another dog-faced monkey will be noticed with a black face and pale reddish-brown in colour. This is the common dog-faced baboon, Cynocephalus sphinx. There are usually several young specimens in the cage. A familiar monkey may come begging, having a black head of hair, a flesh-coloured face, and light brown body, and a knowing but sad expression. This is the bonneted macaque, Macacus sinicus. Another curious and interesting face is that of the sooty manga bay, Cercasabus fuliginosus, from West Africa. He is of a light slaty colour, black forearms and eyebrows, and white whiskers, and flesh-coloured face, dappled with black. There are numerous other examples of this grotesque and motley group of creatures. The village pump and draw well, by means of which the monkeys pump and draw water for themselves, the elevator, whence they supply themselves with corn, the large wheel, the rocking horse, the running donkey, the aerial flight, and other gymnastic appliances, upon which the monkeys play, afford considerable amusement to children. Many people enjoy feeding the monkeys. Fruit is better for them than nuts, and they much prefer it. 
in the large cages along one side of the monkey house to which are attached open air compartments will be found forty five rhesus macacus rhesus india forty six sutty manga bay cercosabus fuliginosus these monkeys come from the west coast of africa and are in general quiet and tractable making good pets in order to get a good price for them sailors used to say these monkeys came from manga bay which is a district of madagascar vervet monkey cercopithecus lalandii south africa forty seven diana monkey cercopithecus diana the prettiest of this large and graceful group of west african monkeys forty eight hamadryad baboons cynocephalus hamadryas arabia and abyssinia in the ancient egyptian religion these monkeys were sacred to thoth and held the scales in which were weighed good and evil forty nine moustache monkey cercopithecus johnsonii west africa these monkeys are so called from the light streak on their upper lip fifty rhesus monkey macacus rhesus and star bonnet monkey macacus sinicus india the rhesus or bunda is often of a fierce disposition and to be avoided as a pet for children it is sometimes worshipped in india and was often given as a present to foreign rulers it is figured on the black obelisk of shalmaneser king of assyria eight hundred and forty b c fifty one guinea baboon fifty two marmoset hapele jacos southeast brazil star doraculi nietipithecus trivigatus guyana these owl monkeys are entirely nocturnal they eat eggs small birds insects and fruit mona monkey cercopithecus mona west africa fifty three guinea baboon cynocephalus sphinx africa these are adult specimens of a monkey very commonly imported young under the name of dog-faced baboons many specimens may be seen in the large central cage fifty four black lemurs lemur macaco madagascar lemur in malagasy means ghosts a name they have acquired from their great round eyes and swift silent nocturnal movements the females are reddish brown leaving the monkey house visitors will arrive at the hexagonal enclosure for small carnivora the cages are numbered and contain fifty seven wolf canis lupus europe wolves are crafty cowardly creatures raiding sheepfolds and farmyards at dead of night but when pressed by hunger they are very dangerous they breed freely with the domestic dog which is probably descended from wolves and jackals the pariah dogs of all countries usually resemble the wild races of the district fifty eight arctic fox canis lagopus northern europe and asia fifty nine star indian wolf canis palipes sixty star samoyed sledge dog sixty one pet wolf deposited by private burton fourth king's own regiment sixty two star coyote or prairie wolf canis latrans north america to the right is the maize which is of entirely original design and was planted in the spring of eighteen seventy in the centre a large piece of ornamental rockwork has been erected from the summit of which a complete view of the plan of the maze may be obtained one penny each is charged for admission turning to the left and walking alongside the maze the visitor reaches the figure eight toboggan passing underneath this structure we reach sixty four star mysore cattle boss indicus india one of several varieties of these fine beasts which are so useful to the hindus sixty five chillingham bull bos taurus a typical representative of the english wild cattle notice the black muzzle and ears sixty six and sixty seven pair of bison bison americanus once very common in the vast prairies of north america 
where great herds, numbering many thousands, roamed, hunted only by the Red Indian. The advent of transcontinental railways resulted in their disappearance as wild creatures. A few small herds, collected from zoological gardens, etc., were placed under special protection, and the numbers are now increasing. The visitor now enters the paddock range of cages. 68 is an aviary containing a miscellaneous collection of foreign and British birds, several kinds of which have been seen in the aviaries in the Lion House. Note the water voles, Avicola amphibious, commonly called water rats. They are vegetable feeders, quite innocuous to the birds. 71. Dwarf cattle, India. 72. Broad-tailed sheep, Asia. The tails of these sheep often weigh as much as 40 pounds, and sledges are provided to carry them. 73. Bactrian, or two-humped camel, Camelus bactrianus, Asia. 74. White and common fallow deer, Dama vulgaris, Europe. 75. Dwarf zebu, India. These animals are full-grown. 76. Samber hind, Servus Aristolelis, India. 77. Tar, Hermitragus gemlicus, a wild goat inhabiting thickly wooded slopes of the Himalayas, India. 78. Fallow deer. 79 to 80. Zebra. Bred in 1904 in Vainol Park, Bangor, the property of Miss E. Lort, Port Dinowi, Wales. In the early days of the Dutch settlements, immense herds of these animals roamed the plains of South Africa. They are now becoming very scarce and difficult to obtain. 81 to 82. Barasinga or Swamp Deer, Servus Duvaselli, India. 83. Brahmin Bull, India. 84. Marshall Hawk Eagle, Spitzaitus bellicosus, South Africa. 85. Condor, female, Sarcohamphus gryphus. The male has a large erect comb over the beak and head. They are peculiar to the highest peaks of the Andes in South America. 86. Secretary vultures, Serpentarius reptilivorus, South Africa, so called from the pens behind the ears. They are true vultures and live by no means exclusively on snakes. They run well and are usually on the ground. 87. Griffin vultures, Gips fulvus, North Africa. 88. Tantalus, source of the Nile. 89. Pondicherry vultures, Vultor calvus, India. 90. Roseate cockatoos, Cacatua rosei capilla, with rosy breast and small white crest, natives of Australia. Leadbetter and yellow crest cockatoos, red and yellow macaws, Aramacau, Central America. 91. Crown crane, Balerica pavonina, West Africa. Peafowl, Parvo cristatus, India. 92. Pelicans, Pelicanus crotalus, Southern Europe and North Africa. The pouch beneath the beak is used to assist their fishing. Pelicans have sufficient intelligence to work together in driving fish to little bays where they can be easily caught. 93. African Woodstock, Pseudotantalus ibis, West Africa. In the first season, this bird is a drab colour and requires three years to attain its beautiful plumage. 94. Marabou Stork, Leptoptilus cruminiferus, Africa. 95. Egret, Garzetta candidissima, America. Note the long filiated plumes called osprey by milliners. Little owl, Athene noctua, Europe. 96. Marabou stork, Leptoptilus cruminiferus, Africa. A similar race is found in India. Leaving these cages and turning to left, several open air yards will be seen. 98. Nilgau antelope, Portax pictus, India. 99. Tian Shan ibex, Capris ibericus, Siberia. 
one hundred star pair of llamas llama peruana southern parts of south america the llamas are closely related to the camel and like them are used as beasts of burden one hundred and one tarpan star wild horses equus prievalski mongolia presented to the collection by lord rothschild f z s tring the true race from which the domestic horse is descended formerly inhabiting the plains of europe and asia they are now only found in the wild and inhospitable mountains of mongolia they are sure-footed as goats and born jumpers the mare recently cleared the fence which is four foot six high they were ridden down and captured as foals and brought up by foster mothers the animals from these cages are frequently turned loose into the adjoining paddock grazing with them are goats capra hircus spain some dwarf icelandic sheep and a number of black and white sheep from palestine of the race of the ring straked of laban's flock proceeding onwards with the grazing paddock on the left and the lawn for croquet on the right the visitor reaches an eastern-like kiosk designed by thomas danson esq london which is divided into compartments containing one hundred and two emus dromaeus novi hollandii australia one hundred and four the rea ornandan rea americana two deposited by g faulkner esq a flightless bird found on the pampas of paraguay these birds are quite harmless and often at liberty in the gardens the race is highly considered as a possible domestic breed it yields forty pound carcass of good food and lays an egg more than sufficient for an omelette the smaller cage contains one hundred and three wood owl europe visitors will now be near the long sight entrance to the gardens from this point visitors may proceed either directly up the avenue towards the large hall or may cross the carriageway and passing over the tennis lawn inspect the kitchen salad and nursery garden connected with the establishment in this division also are situated the greenhouses and frames in which the bedding out plants are protected during the winter and where peaches grapes melons cucumbers etc are grown during the summer months the athletic ground with cycling and running tracks lies to the left through the large doors near the greenhouses passing the greenhouses and crossing over the drive we reach one hundred and ten capybara or water cavy hydrochorus capybara abounds in the tropical rivers of brazil and la plata living generally in small companies in the heavy vegetation of the banks it swims and dives with the greatest ease the animal sometimes attains a weight of two hundred pounds the flesh is edible visitors then arrive at the penguin house here may sometimes be seen a group of those extraordinary birds the black-footed penguins sveniscus demersus natives of the south seas their erect walk paddle-like wings and grotesque appearance provoke much merriment in the tank where they are fed at short intervals they are very active and fly in the water with surprising swiftness in addition the cormorants and shags provide a very interesting exhibition on the western side of this house are several cages occupied by pheasants and small birds one hundred and eleven swinhoe pheasants euplocomus erythrophthalmus formosa one hundred and twelve lady amherst pheasant thaumatea amherstii western china one hundred and thirteen golden pheasant thaumelia picta china one hundred and fourteen silver pheasant euplocomus nycthemerus china one hundred and fifteen ring-necked pheasants phasianus torquatus a chinese bird that is now largely bred in this country crowned crane africa and demoiselle crane south europe and north africa one hundred and sixteen fishing cormorants holland the cormorants phalacrocorax are found all over the world in china and japan for centuries they have been used for fishing 
a strap attached below the gullet prevents the bird from swallowing the fish which is taken out by the fisherman a blazing brazier is often fixed in the boats to attract the fish at night one hundred and seventeen horned owl buto virginianus north america one hundred and eighteen caracara polyborus brasiliensis brazil one hundred and nineteen star buzzard hawk butea vulgaris europe perhaps the most pugnacious of the hawks one hundred and twenty black vulture catharista atrata north america one hundred and twenty one wood owl england one hundred and twenty two adjoining this is the flying cage containing black-headed gulls larus ridibundus and common gulls larus canus europe sarus crane grus antigon north india white-necked crane anthropoides lucachen japan crane grus communis europe curlews numenius aquata europe asia and africa on the adjoining ponds are various swans namely the mute swan cygnus olor buick swan cygnus buicki distinguishable by its yellow bill these are from northern europe and asia also cygnus atratus the black swan of australia the two latter have quite an agreeable note also egyptian geese chenalopex egyptiacus very pretty but usually tyrannous to smaller waterfowl one hundred and twenty three an open-air tank occupied by two female californian sea lions utaria californiana note the cape and californian races have bred in the collection three times the first instance of this hybrid the californian sea lions inhabit the northern pacific and are numerous on the coast near san francisco the cape sea lions which are small fur seals are found in the south atlantic the animals can pass to and from the large sea lion house here in a tank sixty four feet by twenty feet and three feet deep the animals go through a variety of evolutions in the tank diving from a height leaping over poles through hoops swinging on crossbars etc the speed at which they rush through the water is most remarkable the male sea lion utters a loud barking noise facing the tank are several small cages one hundred and twenty five porcupines hystrix crista north africa eat roots and vegetables the porcupine was the show beast of henry the first menagerie at woodstock eleven hundred and twenty a d one hundred and twenty six wood owl europe one hundred and twenty seven californian sea lions one hundred and twenty eight angola vulture gipochierax angolensis africa leaving this house and turning to the right the camel house is reached the cages are numbered one hundred and twenty nine pair of giant zebu bos indicus the sacred cattle of india held in such veneration by the hindus that they are allowed to feed where they will and may take their rest undisturbed in the busiest thoroughfare egyptian worship of apis and the hebrew adoration of the golden calf are similar phases of the deification of the sources of material prosperity one hundred and thirty yak male pifagus grunyens the grunting ox of tibet a most useful beast of burden in the high mountains where its thick coat enables it to withstand the cold one hundred and thirty one star gnu south africa presented by his grace the duke of bedford k g the tail is a prominent adjunct in the ceremonies and incantations of the kaffir medicine man one hundred and thirty two indian buffalo bubalus buffalos used for milk and field service by the indians they are well able to protect themselves from wild beasts even sher bach the tiger feared to encounter the buffalo cows one hundred and thirty three bactrian camel camillus bactrianus south russia there are cells in the body of these animals in which water supply can be stored sufficient for seven days 
They are therefore useful in traffic over desert places. They are bred as carefully as horses for the work in hand. The double humped are usually used for heavy burdens, the single for speedy saddle work. Camel riding is not pleasant for a novice. It produces a nausea similar to seasickness. 134. Pair of Sambur deer. Servus Aristotelis. The largest Indian deer. 135. Brazilian tapir. Tapirus americanus. Closely allied to the elephant and rhinoceros, and exceedingly abundant in prehistoric times. 136. Sambur hind. 137 and 138 star eland orias canna south africa these magnificent antelopes are diminishing in numbers in the wild state but are more and more kept in a domesticated state they are useful as draught animals and as food the meat being more tender than the best beef this pair is a present to the collection from the famous woven herd of his grace the duke of bedford k g 139. Paddock for giraffe or other animals in the camel house. Adjoining the camel house are the crane cages. 140. Blue fox, Alaska, a valuable fur-bearing animal, closely related to the arctic fox. See cage 149. 141. Common fox, Canis vulpes, England. The fox is a cunning animal. Fox hunting with hounds kept for the purpose began in England in 1750. 142. Golden Eagle, Aquilexisaitis, northern parts of Europe, Asia and America. There are few in Scotland. 143. White-headed Eagle, Haliaetus leucocephalus, the national emblem of USA. 144. Star, Pair of Peafowl, Parvo Cristatus, England. 145. Wombat, Fascolimis wombat. An Australian marsupial. These creatures, which weigh a hundred pounds, move very clumsily. De Rougemont, misled by the name, speaks of flying wombats, perhaps the most amusing of his many errors. 146. Rhesus monkeys, Macacus rhesus, India. 147. Crane, Grus communis, Europe. 148. Colbe vulture, Gips colbu, Africa. 149. Arctic foxes, Canis lagopus, Arctic regions. These animals have white fur in winter, dark grey in summer. 150. Star, Laughing kingfisher, Australia. The call of this bird resembles a hearty laugh. It is made so regularly that the bird is nicknamed the settler's clock. 151. Animals, when brought up together, live without fear. This cage contains water hens, water voles, commonly called water rats, white rats, guinea pigs, doves, linnets and Siamese cats. The Ape House, erected 1914, contains 152. Hulok Gibbon, Hylobates Hulok, Assam, the smallest and most graceful of the man monkeys or anthropoid apes. They are arboreal in habit and progress often by great leaps from tree to tree. On the rare occasions that they reach the ground, they usually walk on two legs. 153 and 154. Chimpanzees, Orthropithecus troglodytes, West Africa. Your attention is called to the nest constructed on the platform by the chimpanzee in cage 154. It has long been known that the orangutan constructs a platform on which to sleep. The natives of West Africa say the chimpanzee both makes a platform and puts on a roof. The nest on this platform is the first known instance of such work by a chimpanzee in captivity. The nest is used for eating in and for sleeping. No attempt has been made to form a roof. At a distance of 20 yards, the elephant house is reached, erected during the winter 1875. The right-hand cages are numbered. 155 and 156, Maras, Dolichotis pataconica, 
Argentine and Patagonia. 157. Jays, Garrulus glandarius, England. One of our brightest and most gaily coloured birds, that contrasts strongly with its nearest relative, the crow. 158. Viscacha, Lagastomus trichodytilus, Buenos Aires. These animals collect glittering objects to ornament their burrows. These animals have bred in the gardens. 159. Star, Skunk, Mephitis mephitica. These animals defend themselves by the emission of a most disgusting odour. Their prominent black and white coat is a good example of protective warning colours. 160. Malabar Squirrel, Shirius Maximus, India. 161. White Guinea Pigs, Cavia Porcellus. 162. Kangaroo Rat, Potterus tridactylus, Australia. 163. Badger, Meles Taxus, Britain. The badger is one of the few animals that are lighter above than below, gaining thereby a descriptive colouring against the skyline, which has a concealment value in hunting the small animals on which they prey. Badgers are still common in England and are often found close to large towns. 164. Raccoon, Procyon Lotor, US America, wets its food before feeding, hence called the washing bear. 165 and 166. Cotimondi, Nasuarufa, South America. These active animals eat birds' eggs and birds which they catch in the trees. 167. Aguti, Dasiprocta aguti, South America. 168. Black guinea pigs. 169. Hairy armadillo, Dasipus villosus, La Plata. 170. Prairie marmots, Synomis ludovicianus, North America. Live and breed in this country and ought to be more popular as a boy's pet. 171. Meerkat, Suricata tetradactyla, South Africa. Make excellent pets, they are fervent sun worshippers. 172. A large glass fronted enclosure decorated with ferns and other plants. Here in the tropical heat is the giant tortoise from the Galapagos Islands in the Pacific Ocean, Testudo ephipium, star. With the saddle shaped shell, a native of Duncan Island, it is probably 100 years old. A number of lizards and Pekin robins, Leothrix luteus, may be seen among the plants, and the fruit bat, Teropus medius, or flying fox from India, which sleeps until dusk, hanging head downwards like some wonderful fruit. The curious jaboa, Jacolus orientalis, hops in the sand. It is entirely nocturnal, but a special visit after nightfall to see this kangaroo-like creature will be amply repaid. 173. Bactrian or double-humped camels, Camelus bactrianus, Asia. This breed is usually very strongly built and capable of bearing up to 1,000 pounds of a load. A heavy shaggy coat enables it to withstand great cold. The best running camels are found in the one-humped variety, whence it is called dromedary. The two groups breed freely together. 174. Elephant, Elephus indicus. Daisy, caught in Upper Burma in the spring of 1895. The adults are used by the government for military purposes. 175. Indian elephant, female, about 10 years old. Purchased March 1907. These animals parade in the gardens, carrying visitors at a small charge. 176. Hippopotamus, male, Hippopotamus amphibious. Born October 1906. Inhabiting the rivers of Central and South America, and although so awkward and clumsy, swimming with perfect ease. He is a night-roaming animal, feeds upon aquatic plants, etc., and is much hunted for the tough hide and great teeth. 177. Star, Indian cattle, Bos indicus. The Guzerat variety. Other races are to be seen in the camel house.
Leaving this house, we find on the right the elephant tank, built in the year 1906 as a bathing place for the large animals in this house. The kangaroo range of cages will be seen on the left. These cages are occupied by various species of kangaroos, etc., and are numbered as follows. 178. Ringtail lemurs, Lima cata, Madagascar. The lemurs are very numerous in Madagascar, to which they are almost wholly confined. They represent an early genus of animal saved from destruction by deep water surrounding the island. These animals breed freely in the gardens. Notice the young ones clinging to their mothers. 179. Young Sphinx Baboons, West Africa. 180. Ringtail Capuchin, Cebus Fatuellus, Guyana. The prehensile-tailed monkeys are only found in South America. The Cebus use a stone to crack nuts, are generally intelligent and good-tempered, and make excellent pets. 181 and 182. Marmoset, Hapale Jacos, Brazil. 183. Black faced spider monkey, Ateles Ate, Eastern Peru. Notice the tail which is used as a hand. 184. Patas monkey, Cercopithecus patas, West Africa. This curious beast is generally known as the Huzar, cat face or death's head monkey. 185. Giant kangaroo, male, Macropus giganteus, North Australia. The males attain a height of six feet and cover the ground in bounds of fifteen feet or more. 186. Wallaby kangaroo and young, Macropus benetti, Tasmania. 187. Black tailed wallaby, Macropus wallabatus, Victoria, Australia. Also red bellied wallaby. Macropus biladieri, Tasmania. Leaving these cages on the left and passing the tobacco divan, the visitor will arrive at the first class refreshment room. Here, at slightly higher charges, parties can obtain teas and light refreshments, adjoining our lavatories and retiring rooms. Ascending the bank opposite, visitors will have upon their left the outdoor platform for dancing upon and for other amusements, and from this point a complete view may be obtained of Messrs. Hastain and Caney's grand open-air picture. To the left is the King's Hall, erected 1910, suitable for demonstrations, exhibitions, social gatherings, etc. Visitors who have provided themselves with their own refreshments may obtain hot water, teapots, cups, knives and other requisites in the King's Hall, the entrance to which is in front of this picture, below the central block of buildings. When this room is closed, hot water can be obtained at the refreshment rooms. Tuppence is charged for this accommodation. Adjoining the outdoor platform is an entrance to the great ballroom. The roof is ornamented with views of the most interesting places on the globe. Mr. R. Caney's pictures on the side wall give a lifelike idea of the best-known animals in their native haunts. The skating rink, to which there is no extra charge, adjoins this room. It is over 200 feet long and is provided with a perfect maple floor. The best of skates may be hired. The refreshment room is situated at the upper end of the ballroom. The prices are fixed as detailed on page 29 and strict attention is paid that all articles sold are of the best quality. Through the refreshment rooms are the large tea rooms, recently redecorated with scenes of Chinese life. One shilling and threepence each is charged for admission. Tea with various preserves, bread and butter, biscuits, salad, etc. is supplied to all in this room. The Chinese cafe and smoke room adjoining meets the convenience of visitors preferring light refreshments a la carte. The ladies' and gentlemen's rooms and parcel office are in the lower portion of the music hall. Coats, umbrellas, baskets or parcels left during the day should be asked for at least a quarter of an hour before the fireworks to prevent the great crowding consequent on their being required immediately after leaving the music hall by the opposite door from which we entered, and passing by the recently enlarged model room, 
filled with all the latest automatic novelties, we are in front of the printing office, where the placards and handbills are printed, announcing the extra attractions of the gardens, etc. Passing the entrance to the printing office, and entering the house containing leopards, panthers, etc., we have 187a, Sloth Bear or Ass Whale, Melursus Ossinus, India, captured by W. Nash, Esquire, at Jubalpur, and presented to the collection by Mrs. A. W. Watney, of Seven Oaks, Kent. 188. Indian Jungle Cat, Felis Caus, lives on birds and small mammals, are fond of water and swim well. 189. 190. Wolf by Dog Hybrid, these are comparatively easy to obtain. 191 and 192. Spotted Hyena, Hyena Crocuta, Somaliland. These are night-roaming animals, living chiefly upon carrion. Their jaws are powerful enough to crush the hardest bones. This variety is often called the Laughing Hyena. 193. African Leopardess, three years old. Presented to the collection by F. Makin Esquire, Accra, West Africa. 194. Pair of Lion Cubs. 195. Fox by Dog Hybrid. Between a dog fox and sheep dog bitch. These hybrids are very rare. 196. Lioness, Felis Leo, Africa. Leaving the Leopard House, the visitor will be at the entrance to the Museum of Natural History and Reptile House, admission one penny. Here, in a large gallery, are a miscellaneous collection of birds, animals, reptiles, etc., almost all of which have lived in the gardens, including the enormous orangutan, Simia satyrus, or wild man of the woods of Borneo, caged in the Lion House in the summer of 1899. At the end of the room is a skeleton of the celebrated performing elephant Maharaja, late of Wombwells, which at the dispersal of that renowned collection, in the year 1872, was purchased by Messrs. Jennison and lived ten years in the gardens. The live serpent collection comprises specimens of the deadly rattlesnake, Crotalus horridus, from North America, the fair de lance, or yellow viper, Crasbidocephalus crotalus, from Brazil and the West Indies, long-nosed viper, Asia, also puff adder, Betis arietans, South Africa, saber pythons and royal pythons from South America, and boa constrictors from South America, sand snakes, Eryx joni, from the deserts of India, glass snake, Ophiosaurus apus, Southeast Europe, ring snake, England, the constrictive group occupies the great snake cage near the picture lake. The curious Menoporma, Cryptobranchus alleganiensis, a large aquatic salamander from Ohio, known by various names, water puppy, hellbender, etc. Lizards and skinks from Australia, the tuberculated iguana and tegexins from tropical America, and monitor lizards from Bengal. The rare mastigures, or thorny-tailed lizards from North Africa and North India, and wall lizards, Lacerta viridis and Lacerta moralis, Europe, invaluable for catching slugs, worms, etc., and numerous frogs and toads, including the tree frog, Hyla arborea, and the edible frog, Rana esculenta, a dainty dish eaten by our French neighbours, the terrapin, Malaclemis palustris, famous among epicures, they are found on the coast from New York to Texas. Donations Armitage Miss, Little Hulton, Peafowl and White Swan Alexander Sir Claude Bart, Wolf Dog Hybrid Arbil M. Carisbrook, Victoria Park, Maribu Stalk, Deposited Bags G. Alexandra Park, Calithrix Barlow W. H. Esquire, Manchester Yellow-fronted Amazon Parrot Beaumont, C.F., Hollinwood, Festive Amazon Parrot Bedford, His Grace, the Duke of Male Bison, Gnu, Pair of Elands, Indian Cattle Beckett, Thomas, Esquire, Longsight, Rose-breasted Cockatoo Brocklehurst, Sir Philip, Badger 
Burroughs, J. S. Esquire, Atherton, Macaws. Burroughs, Miss, Atherton, Doroculi. Burton, Private L. Ulverston, Pet Wolf, Deposited. Butter, Dr. J. Mustache Monkeys, Drills and Vandrills. Lemurs, Civets, Llamas, Horned Owl, Crowned and Demoiselle Cranes, Deposited. Champion, B. M. de Crespigny, Denmark Hill, London, Rhesus Monkey. Chalton T. Esquire, Altringham, Slender Bill Cockatoo. Collet, Mrs. Hale, Rosebreast and Yellowbreast Cockatoos. Cooper J. Heaton Chapel, Barnard Parakeet. Cornwall Walker, Mrs. M. E. Rygate, Bonneted Macaque. Coops, Mrs. Clayton Bridge, Yellowcrest Cockatoo. Cowley, Mrs. Manchester, Du Corpse Cockatoo. Cresswell, Miss I, Red Macaw. Davenport J. Esquire, Gorton, Tuberculated Iguana. Drake G. T. Esquire, Cobry Manor, Maidstone, Coyote, Indian Wolf, Eagles and Vultures. Durman, Miss, King's Head, Deansgate, Rhesus Monkey. Elam A, East Road, Longsight, Yellow Naped Parakeet, Australia. Ellis William, Ridi Ruin, Clandidlows, Kestrels. Emery E. F., Cheetham Hill, Yellow Crest Cockatoo. England J. S., S. S. Britia, American Small Birds. Garnet, Mr., Pine Snake. Goodwin C. R. Macclesfield, Green Monkey. Hembrow, Miss A., Usk, Pair of Badgers. Hawkins, Mrs. K., Wilmslow, Pair of Canadian Geese. Hutchings, Mrs. Clapham, Salmon Crested Cockatoo. Ingham, Mr. B., Reddish, Pair of Cockatiels. Jackson, Mrs. H., Hightown, Green Parakeet. Lapler, Mrs. Moss Side, Green Parakeet. Lord, Miss, Banger, Zebra, Deposited. Lupton, Charles, Esquire, Leeds, Slender Build Cockatoo. Marples, Mrs. Chalton, Pair of Ring-Necked Parakeets. Macon, F.E., Accra, West Africa, Leopardess. Mills, Y.S., Haverford West, Rook. Mirrens, J., Waterloo Road, Cheetham Hill, Mealy Amazon Parrot. Neville, Thomas, N.C., Esquire, Bramall Hall, near Stockport, Himalayan Black Bear. O'Connell, Doctor, Wavertree, Thorn-Tailed Lizards and Cunningham Skink. Phillips, Mrs. A., Glossop, Yellow Crest Cockatoo. Pitt, Reverend, Littleborough, Bonnet Monkey. Rayson, H., Esquire, Stoke, Buzzard Hawk. Rothschild, Lord, F.Z.S., Tring Park, Tring, Pair of Prevalski Wild Horses. Mongoose, Hybrid Bear, Lemur, and Giant Tortoises. Royal Society for Prevention of Cruelty to Animals. Russian Brown Bear. Salisbury E. Esquire, Wigan, Pair of African Hawks. Shaw H. Esquire, Levenjum, Mona Monkey. Simmons, Mrs. W. N., South Godston, Surrey, Tame Fox. Steintal, Madam, West Didsbury, Green and Yellow Budgerigars. St. Quentin, W. H. Esquire, Seamston Hall, Rillington, Giant Kingfisher, Demoiselle Cranes. Taylor N. Esquire, Chalton on Medlock, West African Snakes. Trivet F. Esquire, Axminster, Grass Snake. V. C. J. T. Esquire, Old Trafford, Green Indian Parrot. Walden, Lord Howard De, Peregrine Falcon, Trained. Walgren, Monsieur Leon, J. F., African Widers and Singing Finches. Wormsley, Mrs. Tong Moore, Mona Monkey. Watson, J. H. Esquire, Tussor, Silk Moths and Cocoons. Watney, Mrs. A. W., Ivy Hatch Court, Seven Oaks, Himalayan Bear Cubs. Willis, Mrs., The Rectory, Warrington, Peacock. End of Part 2
of Guides to the Zoological Gardens, Bellevue, Manchester. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Price Lists for Refreshments and Cab Fairs from the 1891 and 1917 Guides. 1891 Price List of Refreshments Tea or Coffee, per cup, threepence Tea with bread and butter, biscuits, salad, etc., one shilling Plate of meat or ham, to tea in tea room, sixpence Ham or beef sandwiches, per square, twopence Plate of meat or ham with bread, ninepence Salad, per plate, twopence Veal pies, threepence Eccles cakes, tuppence. Buttered biscuits, tuppence. Plain biscuits, a penny. Buns, a penny. Ginger beer, per bottle, tuppence. Lemonade, Jewsbury and Browns, per bottle, threepence. Soda water, ditto, small bottle, tuppence. Ginger ale, ditto, small bottle, tuppence. Lemonade, Schweppes, per bottle, sixpence. Soda water, ditto, fourpence small cakes and other confectionery various milk per glass tuppence wines etc champagne moet and chandon's extra superior bottle ten shillings half bottle six shillings moet and chandon's first quality bottle ten shillings half bottle five shillings moet and chandon's white dry Bottle ten shillings, half bottle five shillings. Bollinger's Bottle twelve shillings, half bottle six shillings. Pomery and Grenos Bottle fourteen shillings, half bottle seven shillings. Clico Bottle twelve shillings, half bottle six shillings. Jules Mums Bottle ten shillings, half bottle six shillings. Sparkling Sauterne Bottle five shillings, half bottle, two shillings and sixpence. Rhine wines, H and G Hirsch. Still Hock, Marco Brunner. Bottle seven shillings and sixpence, half bottle, four shillings. Still Hock, Scharlachburger. Bottle six shillings, half bottle, three shillings and sixpence. Sparkling Hock, bottle six shillings, half bottle, three shillings and sixpence. Sparkling Moselle, bottle six shillings, half bottle, three shillings and sixpence. Burgundy, Romanet, 1870 vintage, bottle seven shillings and sixpence. Chambertin, bottle ten shillings. Clarets, Chateau de Bechevel, 1870, bottle eight shillings and sixpence. Saint Julien Superieur, 1874. Bottle, seven shillings, half bottle, four shillings. Saint Julien, bottle, five shillings, half bottle, two shillings and sixpence. Pouillac, bottle, two shillings and sixpence, half bottle, one shilling and sixpence. Port Wines, Tate, 1861 vintage, bottle, ten shillings. Bon Retiro, 1866 vintage, eight shillings. Sandiman's 1870 vintage, seven shillings. Sandiman's old blended, bottle five shillings, half bottle two shillings and sixpence. Sherry's Amontillado, Julien Permatans, bottle five shillings and ninepence, half bottle two shillings and sixpence. Ditto, bottle five shillings, half bottle two shillings and sixpence. Bass's ale or Guinness's stout. Large bottle, sixpence. Bellevue Pale Ale or Guinness's Stout. Small bottle, threepence. Per glass, tuppence. Bitter Ale, per glass, tuppence halfpenny. Cigars, tuppence and threepence each. Havana cigars, fourpence and sixpence each. Glass of wine, brandy or other spirits, sixpence. Smaller and other quantities, to order. No less charge than sixpence if spirits or wines are delivered by a waiter. Cab fares to and from Bellevue Gardens, Manchester, to or from the coach stand at 
prices for one or two passengers or three or more passengers albert square two shillings and threepence three shillings albert street two shillings and sixpence three shillings and fourpence all saints church one shilling and ninepence two shillings and fourpence ardwick green higher end one shilling and threepence one shilling and eightpence ardwick green lower end one shilling and sixpence two shillings ardwick railway station one shilling and threepence one shilling and eightpence bank parade salford three shillings four shillings blackfriars street deansgate two shillings and threepence three shillings bridgewater viaduct hume two shillings and sixpence three shillings and fourpence broad street bolton road salford four shillings five shillings and fourpence broad street to longsight entrance three shillings and ninepence five shillings brook street charlton upon medlock one shilling and ninepence two shillings and fourpence brook street to longsight entrance one shilling and sixpence two shillings burlington street oxford road one shilling and ninepence two shillings and fourpence burlington street to longsight entrance one shilling and sixpence two shillings city road hume two shillings and threepence three shillings cornbrook chester road two shillings and ninepence three shillings and eightpence corporation street manchester two shillings and threepence three shillings juicy street charlton upon medlock one shilling and ninepence two shillings and fourpence juicy street to longsight entrance one shilling and sixpence two shillings duke street broughton salford three shillings and threepence four shillings and fourpence eccles old road near hope church five shillings six shillings and eightpence elizabeth street york street cheetham two shillings and ninepence three shillings and eightpence elizabeth street to longsight entrance three shillings four shillings free trade hall and theatre royal two shillings and threepence three shillings gloucester street manchester two shillings two shillings and eightpence great cheetham street broughton three shillings and threepence four shillings and fourpence great clues street lower broughton three shillings and threepence four shillings and fourpence great juicy street the assize courts two shillings and ninepence three shillings and eightpence halliwell lane cheetham three shillings and sixpence four shillings and eightpence halliwell lane to longsight entrance three shillings and ninepence five shillings hume town hall two shillings and threepence three shillings hunts bank manchester two shillings and sixpence three shillings and fourpence junction street hume two shillings and threepence three shillings junction street to longsight entrance two shillings two shillings and eightpence leaf square pendleton three shillings and sixpence four shillings and eightpence london road station two shillings two shillings and eightpence lower broughton road camp street three shillings and threepence four shillings and fourpence moss lane stretford road hume two shillings and sixpence three shillings and fourpence moss lane to longsight entrance two shillings and threepence three shillings new cross manchester two shillings two shillings and eightpence new cross to longsight entrance two shillings and threepence three shillings nicholas croft high street manchester two shillings and threepence three shillings nicholas street manchester two shillings two shillings and eightpence oldfield road salford and station three shillings four shillings oldham road butler street two shillings and threepence three shillings oldham road near collyhurst street two shillings and sixpence three shillings and fourpence audsall lane station three shillings four shillings audsall lane station to longsight entrance two shillings and ninepence three shillings and eightpence park street higher broughton 
four shillings, five shillings and fourpence. Peel Park, three shillings and fourpence, four shillings and threepence. Peel Park to Longsite Entrance, three shillings, four shillings. Piccadilly, Infirmary, two shillings, two shillings and eightpence. Point View, Berry New Road, three shillings and ninepence, five shillings. Portland Street, David Street, two shillings, two shillings and eightpence. St. Anne's Square, two shillings and threepence, three shillings. St. George's, Hume, two shillings and sixpence, three shillings and fourpence. St. John's, Deansgate, two shillings and sixpence, three shillings and fourpence. St. Luke's, Cheetham Hill Road, three shillings and threepence, four shillings and fourpence. St. Mary's, Upper Moss Lane, two shillings and sixpence, three shillings and fourpence. St. Mary's, to Longsight Entrance, two shillings and threepence, three shillings. St. Oswald's, Rochdale Road, two shillings and ninepence, three shillings and eightpence. St. Oswald's, to Longsight Entrance, three shillings to four shillings. St. Peter's, Dickinson Street, or Lower Mosley Street, two shillings and threepence, three shillings. St. Saviour's, Upper Brook Street, one shilling and sixpence, two shillings. St. Saviour's to Longsight Entrance, one shilling and threepence, one shilling and eightpence. South Junction, Railway Station, two shillings, two shillings and ninepence. Stanley Street, New Bailey Street, Salford, two shillings and sixpence, three shillings and fourpence. Stevenson Square, Manchester, two shillings, two shillings and eightpence. Stockport Road, near Plymouth Grove, one shilling, one shilling and fourpence. Stockport Road to Longsight Entrance, ninepence, one shilling. Swan Street, Rochdale Road, two shillings, three shillings. Trinity Church, Stretford Road, two shillings, two shillings and eightpence. Tewer Street, Oxford Street, one shilling and ninepence, two shillings and fourpence. Tewer Street, to Longsight Entrance, one shilling and sixpence, two shillings. Upper Brook Street, New Bailey Street, two shillings and sixpence, three shillings and fourpence. Victoria Arch, Peel Park, three shillings and threepence, four shillings and fourpence. Victoria Bridge, two shillings and sixpence, three shillings and fourpence. Victoria Station, two shillings and sixpence, three shillings and fourpence. Water Street, Liverpool Road, two shillings and ninepence, three shillings and eightpence. Water Street to Longsight Entrance, two shillings and sixpence, three shillings and fourpence. Waterloo Road, Berry New Road, three shillings, four shillings. Windsor Bridge, Salford, three shillings and threepence, four shillings and fourpence. York Street, Cheetham, two shillings and sixpence, three shillings and fourpence. Where no special remark is made, the fares are the same to each entrance. 1917 Price list of refreshments Tea or coffee per cup, threepence Tea with bread and butter, jam, cake, salad, etc. One shilling and threepence Plate of beef, ham or tongue, sixpence Ham or beef sandwiches, per square, threepence Bread and butter, per plate, threepence and sixpence Salad, per plate, tuppence Veal pies, each, fourpence Buttered biscuits, each, one penny Buns, each, one penny Ginger beer, per bottle, tuppence halfpenny Lemonade, dewsberries and browns, per bottle, threepence Soda water, ditto, small bottle, tuppence halfpenny Ginger ale, ditto Small bottle, tuppence halfpenny. Cider, per glass, tuppence halfpenny. Milk, per glass, tuppence halfpenny. Bovril, per cup, fourpence. Conveyance to and from the gardens. Visitors returning in private carriages or motors may order their servants to be in waiting on the carriage road behind the music hall or near the general entrance. 
the exit for visitors returning by car or on foot, and to the Ashbury's or Manchester railway stations, is near the entrance, a wide gateway and passages being there available, through which ten thousand persons can pass from the gardens in ten minutes. Visitors will escape all the crowding on their return, if they will wait a very short time. Visitors may also return by the Longsight entrance or the Gorton entrance. Tram cars and omnibuses. For cheap car routes and fares to neighbouring districts, consult the maps at the entrances. The Manchester Corporation have two separate lines of electric tramways from Market Street and the centre of the city, by which the gardens may be reached. The most direct is the Hyde Road route, one penny in or out. The cars leave the exchange by this route every four minutes throughout the year, and more frequently on busy occasions. The other route is via Longsight, one penny in or out, where the cars run every three minutes during the greater portion of the day. Passengers alight by this route at the end of Kirkmanjoom Lane, about a quarter of a mile from the Longsight entrance to the gardens. Circular route trams from Cheetham Hill via Queen's Road, Mill Street, Pottery Lane, Dickinson Road, Wimslow Road, Moss Lane East, Brooks Bar to Seymour Grove, and vice versa, run close to each entrance, the Lake Hotel being the stage limit. Halfpenny fares are charged on this route. In addition to the cars on the Hyde Road, many buses will also be waiting and the public are respectfully informed that only by the electric trams can the above fares be guaranteed cabs are also waiting at each entrance a list of cab fares will be found at the end of the guide railway n b add fifty per cent to the fares shown from the london road station by the london and north western railway to longsight station 250 yards from the lower entrance, and by the Great Central Railway to Ashbury Station, 800 yards from the house entrance, or by the Great Central and Midland Company's route to Bellevue Station, near the lake entrance to the gardens. The fares are, to Longsight and Bellevue Stations, third class, twopence, second class, threepence, first class, fourpence. To Ashbury Station, third class, a penny halfpenny, First class, fourpence. Timetables of local services are conspicuously placed in the gardens. The enquiry office at Hyde Road entrance will supply any further information. There is a public telephone, 236 Openshaw, in this office. The foregoing will, for the most part, serve as a guide to all parts of the grounds open to the public. The establishment, in addition, however, contains a large confectionery, bakery, brewery, gasworks, printing office, firework factory, and other places of interest, to view which special permission must be obtained. Cab fares to and from Bellevue Gardens, Manchester. Prices for one or two passengers, and three or more passengers. To and from the stand at. Railway stations. Ardwick, one shilling and threepence, one shilling and eightpence. Bellevue, one shilling, one shilling. Central, two shillings and threepence, three shillings. Cross Lane, Salford, three shillings and sixpence, four shillings and eightpence. Salford, New Bailey Street, two shillings and sixpence, three shillings and fourpence. Exchange, two shillings and sixpence. Three shillings and fourpence. London Road, two shillings, two shillings and eightpence. Old Trafford, three shillings, four shillings. Ortsall Lane, three shillings, four shillings. Ortsall Lane to Longsight, two shillings and ninepence, three shillings and eightpence. Oxford Road, two shillings, two shillings and eightpence. Victoria, two shillings and sixpence, three shillings and fourpence. Hyde Road, one shilling, one shilling and fourpence. Albert Square Town Hall, two shillings and threepence, three shillings. All Saints Church, one shilling and ninepence, two shillings and fourpence. Hardwick Green Higher End, one shilling and threepence, one shilling and eightpence. 
Hardwick Green Lower End, one shilling and sixpence, two shillings. Bank Parade Salford, three shillings, four shillings. Blackfriars Street, Deansgate, two shillings and threepence, three shillings. Bridgewater Viaduct, Hume, two shillings and sixpence, three shillings and fourpence. Broad Street to Longsight Entrance, three shillings and ninepence, five shillings. Brook Street, Charlton upon Medlock, one shilling and ninepence, two shillings and fourpence. Brook Street to Longsight Entrance, one shilling and sixpence, two shillings. Burlington Street, Oxford Road, one shilling and ninepence, two shillings and fourpence. Burlington Street to Longsight Entrance, one shilling and sixpence, two shillings. City Road, Hume, two shillings and threepence, three shillings. Cornbrook, Chester Road, two shillings and ninepence, three shillings and eightpence. Ducey Street, Cholton upon Medlock, one shilling and ninepence, two shillings and fourpence. Ducey Street to Longsight Entrance, one shilling and sixpence, two shillings. Duke Street, Broughton, Salford, three shillings and threepence, four shillings and fourpence. Eccles Old Road near Hope Church, five shillings, six shillings and eightpence. Elizabeth Street, York Street, Cheetham, two shillings and ninepence, three shillings and eightpence. Elizabeth Street to Longsight Entrance, three shillings, four shillings. Free Trade Hall and Theatre Royal, two shillings and threepence, three shillings. Gloucester Street, Manchester, two shillings, two shillings and eightpence. Great Cheetham Street, Broughton, three shillings and threepence, four shillings and fourpence. Great Clues Street, Lower Broughton, three shillings and threepence, four shillings and fourpence. Great Juicy Street, the Assize Courts, two shillings and ninepence, three shillings and eightpence. Halliwell Lane to Cheetham, three shillings and sixpence, four shillings and eightpence. Halliwell Lane to Longsight Entrance, three shillings and ninepence, five shillings. Heaton Moor Road, Heaton Chapel, two shillings and ninepence, three shillings and eightpence. Hume Town Hall, two shillings and threepence, three shillings. Hunt's Bank, Manchester, two shillings and sixpence, three shillings and fourpence. Junction Street, Hume, two shillings and threepence, three shillings. Junction Street to Longsight Entrance, two shillings, two shillings and eightpence. Levenjoom, Midway Hotel, one shilling and sixpence, two shillings. Leaf Square, Pendleton, three shillings and sixpence, four shillings and eightpence. Lower Broughton Road, Camp Street, three shillings and threepence, four shillings and fourpence. Midland Hotel, two shillings and threepence, three shillings. Moss Lane, Stretford Road, Hume, two shillings and sixpence, three shillings and fourpence. Moss Lane to Longsight Entrance, two shillings and threepence, three shillings. New Cross, Manchester, two shillings, two shillings and eightpence. New Cross to Longsight Entrance, two shillings and threepence, three shillings. Nicholas Croft, High Street, Manchester, two shillings and threepence, three shillings. Nicholas Street, Manchester, two shillings, two shillings and eightpence. Oldfield Road, Salford and Station, three shillings, four shillings and eightpence. Oldham Road, Butler Street, two shillings and threepence, three shillings. Oldham Road, near Collyhurst Street, two shillings and sixpence, three shillings and fourpence. Park Street, Higher Broughton, four shillings, five shillings and fourpence. Peel Park, three shillings and threepence, four shillings and fourpence. Peel Park to Longsight Entrance, three shillings, four shillings. Piccadilly, two shillings, two shillings and eightpence. Point View, Berry New Road, three shillings and ninepence, five shillings. Portland Street, David Street, two shillings, two shillings and eightpence. Royal Exchange in Corporation Street, two shillings and threepence, three shillings. Salford Town Hall, two shillings and ninepence, three shillings and eightpence. St Anne's Square, two shillings and threepence, three shillings. St George's Hume, 
two shillings and sixpence, three shillings and fourpence. St. John's, Deansgate, two shillings and sixpence, three shillings and fourpence. St. Luke's, Cheetham Hill Road, three shillings and threepence, four shillings and fourpence. St. Mary's, Upper Moss Lane, two shillings and sixpence, three shillings and fourpence. St. Mary's to Longsight Entrance, two shillings and threepence, three shillings. St. Oswald's, Rochdale Road, two shillings and ninepence, three shillings and eightpence. St. Oswald's to Longsight Entrance, three shillings, four shillings. St. Peter's, Dickinson Street or Lower Mosley Street, two shillings and threepence, three shillings. St. Saviour's, Upper Brook Street, one shilling and sixpence, two shillings. St. Saviour's to Longsight Entrance, one shilling and threepence, one shilling and eightpence. Shude Hill, two shillings and threepence, three shillings. Stanley Street, New Bailey Street, Salford, two shillings and sixpence, three shillings and fourpence. Stevenson Square, Manchester, two shillings, two shillings and eightpence. Stockport Road near Plymouth Grove, one shilling, one shilling and fourpence. Stockport Road to Longsight Entrance, one shilling, one shilling and fourpence. Swan Street, Rochdale Road, two shillings, two shillings and eightpence. Trinity Church, Stretford Road, two shillings, two shillings and eightpence. Tewer Street, Oxford Street, one shilling and ninepence, two shillings and fourpence. Tewer Street to Longsight Entrance, one shilling and sixpence, two shillings. Upper Brook Street, New Bailey Street, two shillings and sixpence, three shillings and fourpence. Upper Brook Street, Brunswick Street, two shillings, two shillings and eightpence. Victoria Arch, Peel Park, three shillings and threepence, four shillings and fourpence. Victoria Bridge, two shillings and sixpence, three shillings and fourpence. Water Street, Liverpool Road, two shillings and ninepence, three shillings and eightpence. Water Street to Longsight Entrance, two shillings and sixpence, three shillings and fourpence. Waterloo Road, Berry New Road, three shillings, four shillings. Windsor Bridge, Salford, three shillings and threepence, four shillings and fourpence. York Street, Cheetham, two shillings and sixpence, three shillings and fourpence. Where no special remark is made, the fares are the same to each entrance. End of part three. Part four of Guides to the Zoological Gardens, Bellevue, Manchester. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Evening Entertainments. From the Guide of 1891. Battle of Inkerman. Amongst the wars in which the British have of late years been engaged, that of the Crimea will long be remembered from the enormous cost it entailed on this country in treasure and valuable lives. A short outline of the campaign from its commencement to the Battle of Inkerman, which the Messrs. Danson have chosen for this year's picture, may interest the reader. Standing in front of the painting, the spectator sees represented on an enormous stretch of canvas, some three hundred feet long, by fifty to sixty feet high, the country around Sebastopol, showing the camps of the Allied armies and the almost impregnable position taken up by the enemy. The view is taken from the home ridge. The centre of the picture, the camp of the second division and the Shell Hill, held by the Russians during a great part of the battle, and from which they were finally driven by the British. The sandbag battery, the east and west position, the Kitspur ravine, whilst to the left is the Malakoff fort, and in the distance the town and harbour of Sebastopol, and the distant shores of the Crimea. Since the Battle of Waterloo, England had virtually been at peace, but the aggressive policy of the Russian Emperor Nicholas, and his designs on the Turkish Empire, forced England and France to combine, and to come to the assistance of the Sultan. On the 28th of March, 1854, war was declared by Great Britain. 
a splendid army was at once put into the field under the duke of cambridge and lord raglan whilst the french also joined us with a fine contingent under saint anneau and general canrobert the first act in this great military drama was the bombardment of odessa by the combined fleets under admiral dundas resulting in the total destruction of the forts and shipping the baltic fleet was fitted out and dispatched under command of sir charles napier kronstadt was partially destroyed bomerson shared the same fate whilst the army remained inactive on the shores of the black sea suffering all the ravages of cholera on the fifth of september the army quitted varna and the valley of the plague and landed on the shores of the crimea on the fourteenth the french also effected a landing at the same time rain descended in torrents and the men suffered dreadfully from exposure having little or no covering thus grimly was our war in the crimea inaugurated by suffering and death the red tapism and ignorance of the authorities in london had much to do with this for we had learned nothing in the mode of conducting war since the days of wellington two days tedious marching brought us in front of the enemy who were encamped on the heights of the alma in one of the strongest positions ever occupied by an army the heroic deeds performed by our men during this fiery conflict of three hours resulted in the victorious army bivouacking on the field of the alma the first step in this war had been won and our troops marched hopefully on to crown their efforts by the capture of sebastopol the allied armies now took up position on the heights of balaclava the fleet supporting them from the harbour the bombardment of sebastopol from the sea was now october seventeenth commenced in earnest continuing to the twenty fifth on which day the ever memorable battle of balaclava was fought the annals of british warfare have seldom furnished instances of more heroic deeds than are recorded of our gallant soldiers in this battle half a league half a league half a league and onward into the valley of death rode the six hundred the russians though hitherto unsuccessful were determined not to yield without a desperate struggle a plan was now formed for a grand attack on the whole of the british lines whilst the french were engaged watching the enemy on the extreme left fifty thousand additional troops had been brought into sebastopol and the morning of sunday the fifth of november was fixed for the final attempt on our position on the heights of inkerman all the bells in sebastopol says grant rang a tocsin while the troops composing the sortie at the early hour of three a m stole forth under favour of the darkness and a dense mist and entered the ravines near the tehanaya which were near the british right and our weakest point these movements were unknown to our outpickets and unheard by them though more than one wary old soldier asserted that he had heard something like the rumble of artillery wheels during the very time that the hills commanding the position were being occupied by several large guns cautiously and noiselessly the russian troops stole on their footsteps hidden by the clanging of the great bells till fifty thousand of them were on the flank as well as in the front of our lines and the first intimation the pickets had of their presence in that unexpected quarter was finding themselves almost surrounded by an overwhelming force fighting desperately the pickets retreated to a small redoubt or two-gun battery which had been erected at that point by the suggestion of sir de lacy evans but which from our reduced numbers and the large extent of ground we were compelled to occupy had been dismantled and now it was rapidly destined to become the scene of one of the most sanguinary conflicts in history the russian artillery now opened fire from the slopes of those hills which they had reached unseen at the same moment all the batteries of the town as if further to distract the allies from the real point of attack opened a simultaneous cannonade which dashed to pieces the huts of our men tore up their tents and did dreadful execution in their ranks the brave fellows of our fifty fifth or westmoreland regiment 
peppered the advancing foe through the grass-grown embrasures of the small redoubt, but a rapid charge was made to drive them from their slender position. Nobly and resolutely did this small body of Britons withstand the human flood of inflamed and furious Muscovites that surged around them, a column mustering forty men to one, till at length compelled to fall back, leaving their merciless foes in the redoubt, in which they bayoneted or brained the wounded. Into their thin ranks, as day dawned, the batteries on the hills poured down their iron tempest, and not a man of that regiment would have been left alive to tell its story, had not the 41st Welsh and the 49th Hertfordshire now come into action. Forming line as they advanced, the Welsh and 49th regiments charged up the hill towards the redoubt, and attacked the enemy with brilliant gallantry. Storming they came, shoulder to shoulder, and hurled back the Russians, hundreds of whom, as they were massed in dense columns, fell before the deadly fire of the Minier rifle, and the desperate rush of the headlong bayonet charge that followed it. In the ranks of this and other regiments were many men fresh from Britain, men to whom the long grey-coated and spike-helmeted or flat-capped troops of the enemy, among whom they now found themselves hand to hand and muzzle to muzzle, had been a species of myth, heard of only through the medium of the public prints, and now they had become a terrible reality. Again, however, the batteries dealt destruction in the British ranks, and again they were compelled to fall back before the pressure of unwieldy numbers. The din of battle was growing louder, deeper, hoarser in the valley, and our troops, pressing onward to the attack, in many places could see only the flashing of the musketry in front, the tall brushwood and stunted oaks through which they had to move, being in some places fully breast-high. Thus some corps did not see the Russians until they were within pistol-shot of them. The whole British army was in motion now. Lord Raglan and all the generals of division were in their saddles and upon the scene. Sir de Lacey Evans, who had retired ill on board of a ship, left his bed on the alarm being given, and looking pale and worn, was present in the field. General Strangeways was soon able to bring an artillery force to bear upon the Russian guns, and ere long he silenced their destructive fire. As our artillery came in upon the right, an officer of that force relates that the minier balls flew among them like hailstones, an old simile, but not the less true, that his mare was wounded in two places, and Major Townsend had his horse shot under him. Shot and shell next began to fall thick among the artillery, who were met by some of our infantry falling back. The crest of the hill was at that time covered with smoke, and the entire ground so encumbered by gorse and other bushes, that the guns were wheeled to the front with the greatest difficulty. Suddenly the curtain of smoke lifted, and within ten yards of the cannon were seen the ranks of the Russian infantry, with their long capotes and flat glazed caps, blazing away at our gunners and mowing them down with ease. Major Townshend, who saw the critical position of his guns in that part of the field, gave the order at once to retire, as he was unsupported, but the order came too late, for the Russians were upon him. Another gallant effort to regain the redoubt was made by the 20th and the 47th. Of the former slender corps, 200 men had just come in from the trenches after 24 hours of exposure and rain, but the bugle called all to the front, 500 strong. Their orders were to support the guards, who were heavily pressed by the enemy, many of whom crouched among the brushwood, but were driven down the hill. We had killed numbers of them, says an officer of the 20th, of old the regiment of Wolfe and Kingsley, and as we had no orders to halt, we continued keeping along the hillside, about halfway down, and firing at the retreating enemy. I then heard the bugle sound to retire, and set about trying to get the men back. No easy matter, as by this time, from several regiments being sent after each other, they were all mixed up. After a few minutes' possession of the redoubt, 
the two regiments were forced to retire but during these few minutes there was a frightful massacre on both sides the ground about the work was literally heaped with dead and again the russians on gaining possession of the redoubt slaughtered all our wounded for a short time the battle had been confined chiefly to the artillery on the opposite hills, when the guards advanced under the Duke of Cambridge, and charging into the redoubt, retook it, ferreting the Russians out at the point of the bayonet, and the possession of it was retained by a few hundred of the coal streams against at least six thousand of the enemy. Thrice, with hoarse shouts, the grey-coated masses, with all their bayonets glittering, hurled their valour and their strength madly and bravely uphill against the redoubt and thrice they were hurled back with slaughter and defeat from sebastopol fresh troops were every instant pouring in to reinforce the sortie and ere long the little land in the redoubt was surrounded by a wild horde of infuriated men infuriated by the protracted conflict and the racket with which they had been supplied Back to back the Coldstream guardsmen fought desperately for their very lives. Their comrades were falling fast, and beneath their feet the ground was slippery with blood. Their pouches were emptying fast as their ammunition became expended, and then they were compelled to hurl stones. And next, clubbing their muskets, they beat back the foe, obtained room to form line, and then, with levelled bayonets, they burst through the yielding mass, and leaving more than a thousand Russians dead behind them, regained the household brigade. So vast was the strength of the Russians, that it was impossible so unequal a contest could continue, and, retiring slowly towards their lines, our gallant fellows disputed every foot of ground, and hundreds were falling hourly. The Russians picked off our officers, many of whom had gone into action in their full uniforms, while their men were in greatcoats, and when the former fell, bayoneted them on the ground, or dashed out their brains with the butt-ends of their muskets. The soldiers' letters, with which the prints of the time were full, teem with details of this Muscovite barbarity. The Duke of Cambridge was once quite surrounded, and had it not been for Dr. Wilson of the Seventh Hussars, drawing his sword and cheering a few men on, he must have been killed or taken, and by eleven o'clock in the forenoon, the enemy were close to the tents of the Second Division. Among the prisoners who fell into our hands was a Russian major who had been heard more than once ordering his men to murder the wounded. It was now that General Canrobert with three regiments of Zouaves, five of infantry of the line, and a strong force of artillery, commenced a vigorous attack upon the Russian flanks. And then the issue of the fight did not long remain dubious, and most welcome to the ears of our men was the sound of the Zouave trumpets, and of the French drummers beating the pas de charge. The Zouave battalion was advancing against the sandbag battery when the bearskin reappeared, it was from the wooded hillsides. The Coldstream men, collected by Townshend Wilson, had been toiling in the brushwood, and on seeing the Zouave rushing to the front, joined the advance. The united force marched abreast, the Algerians on the right, and the Zouaves with their friends, for the guardsmen and Zouaves were close friends, the guardsmen on the left. This small battalion marched straight at the body of Russians concealed in the battery, and great slaughter followed, the Russians finally quitting their position, their numbers being considerably lessened in the fierce onslaught. The issue of the fight was now no longer doubtful, as at the Alma a strange wail of despair came from many of the Russian regiments, as they wavered, broke and fled towards the range of hills above Sebastopol, pursued hotly, and trodden down by the mingled British and French soldiers. By three o'clock they were totally routed, and we had obtained another complete victory, but at a terrible loss of life. The area of the field of battle was very limited and unvarying, being nearly confined to the Valley of Inkerman, and the small works captured by and retaken from the enemy. 
the Russians committed many acts of barbarity during the war. One poor fellow, Lieutenant MacDonald, fell wounded from his horse. A soldier placed him with his back to a bush, and facing the approaching enemy, the man wished to remain with him, but MacDonald refused and was left sitting alone. When the Russians approached, they fired at him a great number of times, and several shots struck him, but many on his outer coat. Presently the Russians, seeing that he was not dead, came closer, and began prodding him with their bayonets. Another struck him with the butt-ends of their muskets. He says he did not feel the pain of the thrusts, but confirms the experience which gives rise to the expression, cold steel. He managed to raise himself, and make signs that he was a wounded man, but without effect. He used his fists against some of his assailants, but soon fell prostrate, and at length became senseless. He found himself in the hands of the English once more, and strange to say, the man lived through all his sufferings many years. The scenes on every side far transcended the horrors of a battlefield in general, and many of our dead were found, when cold and stiff, with hands uplifted, and horror and entreaty depicted in their white faces, showing that they had been murdered in cold blood, and had perished in the act of supplication. The whole effective strength of the forces engaged in land service before Sebastopol is thus given by King Lake. The Anglo-French army of 65,000 men, with 11,000 Turks, was to encounter an army whose forces numbered 120,000. The forces actually present on Mount Inkerman were English 7,464, French 8,219, of whom 3,575 were actively engaged against a Russian army of about 60,000, including a great body of cavalry. It would be impossible to record the many brave deeds of our men during the battle. The bravery of Colour Sergeant Walker, who used the butt-end of his rifle with prodigious effect until he got jammed in, and then his fists. About this time, Lord Raglan ordered up two eighteen-pounders, which were dragged up the heights to a position on the home and fore ridge. These guns, worked with such precision by Colonel Dixon, caused great havoc among the Russians when retreating from Shell Hill. Lord Raglan himself rode up to watch the effect, and specially reported on their distinguished services. About this time, it may be said, the battle was drawing to a close. The French contingent, having already abandoned the pursuit, leaving the English to finish the conflict alone, which after two hours' continual fighting, Lord Raglan, with the assistance of his two eighteen-pounders, thoroughly routed General Danoyberg, who, before consulting Prince Menshikov, the Russian commander-in-chief, retired from the field, thus leaving the Allies the victors of that ever-memorable Battle of the Alma. The battles of the Alma and Inkerman have raised the reputation of British infantry higher than ever, and our cavalry at Balaclava extorted the admiration of the world. Evening programme of the picture and firework spectacle of the Battle of Alma, fought September the 20th, 1854, to gain possession of the road to Sebastopol by the allied English and French under Lord Raglan and Marshal saint anneau against the Russians commanded by Prince Menchikov. Season 1896. Price one penny. Firework spectacle. First signal gun. Interval of five minutes, during which, weather permitting, will be dispatched a balloon inflated with gas carrying a brilliant magnesium light, which, after assuming various colours, will ignite and explode the gas and discharge a bouquet of coloured stars. Second signal gun. Water fireworks, firework rockets, signal maroons or shells of magnesium stars. Simultaneous illumination by electricity of the magnificent open-air picture representing the theatre of England's greatest Crimean success, 
painted by the celebrated artists Messrs. Caney and Perkins of the Royal Opera House, Covent Garden, and Drury Lane Theatre, London. The spectator may imagine himself upon the deck of one of the Allied ships, which, keeping pace with the English and French army, sailed south along the Crimean coast. On the extreme left are ships of both fleets, then the finest in the world, but still nothing more than Nelson's ships, propelled by steam. Further to the right, far beyond the British encampment, where the fusiliers stand on guard, is the River Alma, following in a narrow deep channel to the sea. On its left bank, precipitous and difficult to mount, is the Tartar village of Bouliok, with its quaint domed church and salmon tower, a good post of observation to the Russians. Behind the village, the ground rises rapidly, leaving no easy outlet. But the village must be won, and the way forced, for along those heights in the rear runs the road to Sebastopol, the aim and object of the expedition. Prince Menchikov had fixed upon this spot of all others to check the advance, nay, hurl back into the sea the daring invaders, and his camp is seen on the hills in the background, with his numerous forces deployed. For a whole week after the Allied landing at Eupatoria, his army had strengthened the weak places in the defence until every road was covered by formidable artillery, every critical point held by a frowning battery, with its guns trained to sweep the river at every ford. The Spectacle Now the enemy are near at hand. Menchikov makes his last preparations. Soldiers are detailed to set fire to the wooden bridges over the Alma, others to fill the village and its little church with tow and petroleum. Then, through the midst of the army, pass the priests, carrying the hermit's figure of the great Saint Sergius, who saved the kingdom from the Tartar hordes in the centuries long gone by. Shouts greet the procession, and hopes of victory run high. The French bugles are heard calling the onset, as the small but active soldiers rush to the attack, the village is at last set fire to, and harassed by the smoke, and driven back by superior numbers, they are obliged to retreat. Their allies come to their assistance. The Highlanders, under Sir Colin Campbell, rush to the attack, with their national music playing in the van. Near them are the British Grenadiers, commanded by the Duke of Cambridge. Together they cross the river and rush up the slope, but cannot reach the immovable mass of grey-coated soldiery, while their own ranks are mowed down by the well-trained guns from the central earthwork. They too must have artillery. With difficulty, a few guns are dragged across the river and open fire. A gunboat lends its friendly aid, and together they break the dense Russian masses high above them, throwing them into momentary confusion. Now is the soldiers' chance. They charge again on the central redoubt, England and Scotland, side by side. The supreme moment has come. The Russians bring reinforcements to defend the key to their position. On the right, the Scotch. On the left, the Grenadiers, headed by their commanders, rush on the redoubt. Resistance is impossible. The Russians are overwhelmed and the British obtain every point of vantage. At once the scene changes. The army is bodily wheeled away, and there appears the famous Winter Palace at St. Petersburg on a festive evening, while sleighs and figures give life to the wintry scene. The statue of Peter the Great and the naval column appear on the right and left, and the whole is flanked by colossal firework devices representing England's united empire, comprising well-known views typical of home and our colonies, Windsor, a Canadian ice palace, and an Indian temple, the whole terminating with the ascent of a magnificent bouquet of rockets and coloured stars, and the explosion of innumerable fireworks of every description. The firework spectacle takes place every day in Whit Week, 
and every Monday, Wednesday and Saturday afterwards to the 5th of November, inclusive, and during the month of August, also on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Correct guides to the gardens, with names of the animals and birds, can only be obtained at the gardens, price one penny, or by post, one penny halfpenny, on application to John Jennison and Company, Bellevue, Manchester. Zoological Gardens, Bellevue, Season 1898 Evening Programme, describing this panorama of the wild and rocky, bleak and desolate theatre of the Indian Frontier War, waged against the hardiest and most enduring tribal organisations in the world. Clever marksmen, skilled by long practice in every art of mountain warfare, and frenzied fanatics fighting for their homes and faith whose stubborn resistance, marked by many deeds of valour, was only broken by the final triumph of the Anglo-Indian arms, in that heroic and never-to-be-forgotten charge, represented by tonight's firework spectacle, the storming of Dargai. On October 20th, 1897, when the cream of our forces, Scotch, English, Gurkha and Sikh, gallantly responding to an imperative call from General Yeatman Biggs for the capture of this important strategic point, plunged through a decimating hail of lead and drove the warlike Afridis from the precipitous Dargai crest at the point of the bayonet. First Signal Gun Interval of five minutes, during which, weather permitting, will be dispatched a balloon inflated with gas carrying a brilliant colour-changing magnesium light. When almost lost to sight, it flames up in a blaze of glory, exploding and throwing out a bright galaxy of multicoloured stars. Second signal gun, water fireworks, firework rockets, signal maroons, or shells of magnesium stars. Price one penny. The magnificent open-air picture designed and painted by the celebrated artist Mr. R. Caney of the Royal Opera House, Covent Garden and Drury Lane Theatre, London, depicts in one complete harmonious whole the salient features of the Indian frontier country and the daily life of the warlike inhabitants. Few more inhospitable spots exist than these windswept heights of the Lundi Kotal, rising peak beyond peak, till they terminate in the famous Dargai crest, shown in the centre of the picture, with the primeval snows of the Himalayas rising majestic in the far distance. The inhabitants have no settled occupation. Manufactures or tillage do not exist. Some raise cattle and goats, herding them onto the rocky sides of precipitous nullahs. Others gain a scanty livelihood, by cutting brushwood and hill-grass for sale in the bazaars or native shops, and on the spectator's left, a woman descends the hill with her tulwar or sickle and the load of grass. The men do no honest work, their wants are few, a good rifle their most cherished possession. With it they can live as they love, by marauding and stealing, and can protect themselves, for they are always at war, Every hut in the village here is a blockhouse, whose shutters will turn a rifle bullet, and on the left the round stone towers are at once the village lookouts and its last protection. On every side we see armoured men on watch, and in the foreground find native cattle and their herdsmen, water carriers filling goatskin bags at the river, and others embarking on the lake in a rude raft of inflated skins. Two towards the right, under the shadow of the rough, colonnaded and thatch-covered mosque, discuss the recent triumphs of Islam over the Grecian Christians. The Firework Spectacle Twenty electric lights illumine a busy scene. A cart drawn by a zebu bullock brings in a load of grain. The goat herd leads home his flock from the hill pastures and sure-footed camels stand to be relieved by ready hands of their heavy packages. Then from the mosque a gong sounds. All crowds to venerate their aged mullah, 
who, with his attendants, rushes down the hill, and with ever-rising frenzy proclaims the victories of the Crescent, excites them forthwith to attack the British, and promises the arms they sorely need. A camel load of rifles throws them into ecstasies of delight, and soon an excited messenger on a swift camel announces an approaching convoy and sends them all into ambush. The British, taken unawares, fight gallantly against odds. Seek cavalry, lances in rest, relieve the pressure. The baggage animals rush past under Gurkha escort, covered by the English redcoats whose parting volley lays many Afridis low. Then the villagers prepare to face the inevitable reprisals. The mullah, waving high the green flag of Islam, the holy banner of Mahomet, plants it on the hastily constructed sangar or stone barricade. English and Gurkhas, from the higher ground, rush to the charge, but cannot force the pathway without the whirring gatling, whose murderous fire soon makes a practicable breach. With a cheer, the mixed troops are in the village, driving out the Afridis. Then they blow up the towers, burn the houses and defences, and retire. The English last of all, just carrying off as a trophy, the green banner. The tribesmen, stealing back from the surrounding hills, hem in the little band, who, short of ammunition, commence to hurl huge boulders on the foe, when seek cavalry at the gallop, rescue the hard-pressed group, and dismounting, carry off the wounded on their well-trained steeds. The Afridis, reinforced, profiting by the British error, crowd the abandoned Dargai crest, covering the precipitous approach with a thousand rifles. The British commander posts his artillery to play upon the cliff, concentrates his forces in the nullah to the right, and orders the assault. The bugles sound the charge. The little Gurkhas are decimated as they mount the slope. The Derbys and Northamptons, with fixed bayonets, try to force the passage and fail. Lastly, the Gordon Highlanders, exhorted by their colonel, fix bayonets, and to the music of the pipes, clear with cold steel the Afridis from the commanding crest. The scene closes with homage to Piper Findlater V.C., the hero of Dargai. Following this will be shown a magnificently illuminated tableau representing the government house at Calcutta, in the foreground of which the Viceroy of India is receiving a deputation of native princes and chiefs by torchlight, concluding with a most elaborate moving firework device of Hindu serpent charmers and the temple of fountains of golden fire, the whole terminating with the ascent of a magnificent bouquet of rockets and coloured stars, and the explosion of innumerable fireworks of every description. The firework spectacle takes place every day in Whitwick, and every Monday, Wednesday and Saturday afterwards, to the 5th of November inclusive, and during the month of August, also on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Correct guides to the gardens, with names of the animals and birds, and firework programmes, can only be obtained at the gardens, price one penny each, or by post, a halfpenny extra, on application to John Jennison and Company, Bellevue, Manchester. From the Guide of 1917 The Battle of the Ancre For three years now, we have been fighting battles to which in intensity and the use of mechanical not to mention chemical methods of slaughter the fights of old times were but as skirmishes caught unready and attacked by an enemy long preparing for such a contest we fought for long in uneven strife saved by the unflinching devotion of men who gave their lives to repair our errors behind that unbending bullock our armies have grown, our arsenals have provided means to meet the enemy on equal terms. About the middle of 1916, the glorious fighting on the Somme marked our great offensive. It was stayed by bad weather, but the results were not lost. 
Thiepval fell in September. By the middle of November, the fighting north of the Ancre resulted in the capture of 6,000 men and of Beaumont Hamel, with its sevenfold line of trenches. These results owed much to the invention of a new engine of war, a landship or moving armoured fort, a slow squat thing, the famous tank, half humorous, wholly terrible, a toad with the attributes of the tiger. No impediment stops its progress. Trenches are flattened out, or bridged walls fall at a blow from its nose. Its armoured sides are impervious to anything but heavy artillery. Around and over them, the Germans have swarmed, pelting their plated sides with explosives, bombing with hand grenades above and about, in the hope of finding some aperture and some weak spot to get at the heart, but always with the same result, a sudden burst of flame, destruction and desolation. All through the long and trying winter, preparations were in hand to consolidate our gains and drive home our advantage. This the Germans vainly tried to nullify, by a retreat in part strategic, many miles over an eighty-mile front. They were followed up in the bitter winter weather, Bapom, Peroan, and a hundred villages falling into our hands. Brought to bay early in April, between the ninth and twentieth, fourteen thousand prisoners and two hundred and twenty-eight guns rewarded our efforts. The most marked and heroic episode of the time, the grand assault and capture on April thirteenth of the Vimy Ridge. The Battle of the Vimy Ridge showed that there is no position that the Germans may take up, however strong, which given time cannot be carried by our army. The only question is, how much time? If a great deal, we shall progress slowly, and the war may be indecisive until the bad weather comes, as happened last year. If the preparations can be completed rapidly, we may reach decisive results this year. An evacuation of Flanders at least, the destruction of the submarine menace, and, slow it may be but sure, constriction of Germany and her reduction to powerlessness. End of Part 4 End of Guides to the Zoological Gardens, Bellevue, Manchester Read by Phil Benson